day. Uh, we know everyone is busy <laughs> and that your time is precious. We greatly appreciate, greatly appreciate your commitment to bringing earthquake early warning to Californians throughout. We do ask that members who are participating virtually turn on their cameras during the duration of the meeting. We also ask that other, all others attending virtually turn off their cameras. As a reminder, this meeting will be recorded as you've just heard. As for process, please note that we'll save public comment until after the updates for system operations and research and development. And at that time, there will be an opportunity for board member discussion and a public comment period. If you wish to make a statement, please let us know in the room or use the Q&A or raise hand feature in Zoom uh, if you are attending virtually. And the moderator will unmute you at that time. Okay, with that, we'll proceed with the roll call. When called, please take a second to introduce yourself as the individual or as the designee. Secretary of the Natural Resources Agency. Brian Cash here for Secretary Wade Crowfoot. Secretary of California Health and Human Services. I believe that is Melinda and we're still waiting on her arrival. Uh, Secretary of Transportation. Oh, Secretary of California Health and Human Services, excuse me. Yes, hi, this is Julie Soulier um, with Cali Chess and for Dr. Mark Galley. Thank you, Julie. Yes. And we'll go to the Secretary of Transportation. Lori Pepper uh, here on behalf of Secretary Omashaka. Speaker of the Assembly appointee representing the interests of private businesses. Good afternoon, Lupita Sanchez Cornejo, appointee of Speaker Rendon uh, with AT&T. Governor's appointee representing the utilities industry. Believe we will have Angie Gibson, uh, who is the Vice President of Emergency Preparedness and Response for PG&E, she will attend, uh, she'll be joining us, I believe, at the two o'clock hour uh, in replace of Adam Wright, who had uh, a meeting that pulled him away. Next, we'll go to the Senate Committee on Rules Appointee representing county governments. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jeff Tony, uh, County of San Diego, Office of Emergency Services, uh, in for Holly Porter. Chancellor of the California State University. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This is Jack Anderson. I'm representing the Cal State University System, Office of the Chancellor. President of the University of California. Hi, this is Amina Safa, designee of President Michael Drake. Secretary of Business, Consumer Services, and Housing. Hi, good afternoon, not morning. Melinda Grant here on behalf of Secretary Lourdes. We have a quorum, thank you. Director Gilarducci, would you like to provide any opening remarks this afternoon? What? good to see everyone. Uh, and I know how busy everyone has been, but um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just, I guess, summarize by saying fantastic news to see how the earthquake early warning system is evolving and the fact that um, it is, it is uh, proving itself in recent earthquakes. We have been seeing some really great, uh, uh, examples of how we're giving early warning to the public. Uh, we've been getting tremendous amount of feedback from across the different places of, of where the earthquakes are occurring from, from the public themselves, from public safety agencies and others really expressing, um, uh, you know, not just appreciation, but um, excitement over, over what this means. And uh, you know, some really great media coverage. So congratulations to all of you. Um, I think this uh, shows that um, 
you know, the system is, is there, it's working, it's doing what it was designed to do. And um, we'll continue to, you know, evolve it and, and refine it as we continue to work together um, and, and making the system better. Um, I could tell you from, you know, discussions with the governor and many of our other elected leaders in, in just the recent weeks following Santa Rosa and then San Jose, um, you know, in these high population areas where individuals were getting uh, early warning, you know, they they really, really excited about that. And uh, the business community, we've heard from them as well. And I think that we have an opportunity in front of us, a great opportunity in front of us to capitalize on this success, right? To capitalize on the proof positive that that the system is there and it works and it has a benefit. So to rapidly leverage partnerships and relationships and expand into the business community, um, into industry more, more broadly so that they, they automate the system into their capabilities. Um, we don't want to lose that opportunity. We want to, we want to move rapidly to, to expand on it. Um, governor put out a really, uh, powerful statement after the, um, San Jose earthquake talking about the earthquake early warning system and, you know, um, uh, really, you know, part of it was targeted to really focus on industry and, and, and wanting to broaden the capability and engagement of the, of the earthquake early warning system. So from a board standpoint, um, I congratulate you all, uh, but I also want to challenge you all to continue to uh, work to expand this capability. Um, it's good. It will get better. And, and we need to really work uh, together in all of our sectors, right? So who, the various sectors you represent that are sitting on this board today, um, you know, were selected strategically to ensure that we had a broad capability of, um, of this, this uh, system uh, integrated throughout the state. And so we're gonna look to you all for leadership and, uh, and support. Uh, and as well as with our university partners and our, our, our federal government partners and our local depart, uh, partners, you know, throughout, throughout the state. So this is a whole of, whole of government and whole of community approach. And, and so um, really positive feedback from the boss and, um, and from, uh, from other elected officials and from the public. And that's really where you're going to get, you know, folks to wrap around this uh, the system. I think there's been a lot of talk about the system. I think people at the Department of Finance and other places who have worked to fund the system, legislature who continue to support our asks to build around the system, uh, th these events and the and the um, and the the um, you know positive outcomes of the system are things that we we can use to and should use uh, and must use really. Uh, to amplify and to um, demonstrate the success of this program. Um, so um, uh, uh, the other piece on the flip side of not just the, of the you know getting it on your on your on your phone or downloading the app, it's it's um, amplifying the whole issue of preparedness and mitigation. So it also gives us another opportunity to hit those areas to reinforce to the public, what do you do when you get the earthquake early warning? And then how do you, you build in resiliency into your community, into your family, into your home, into your business, right? And then we've been talking with our mitigation division um, and our recovery division to talk about how do we amplify preparedness grants to local governments and uh, to other uh, nonprofits or other entities throughout the state to be able to maximize what we learn in these events to build in mitigation efforts. And we, we, we fund some of that through different granting sources. So we're looking at it in a broad scale, a, a broader uh, sense to try to maximize all of the different resources that we have available uh, to us. And, um, you know, um, I think in the coming months, you know, we're gonna look to our 
industry partners uh, uh, more to try to expand where we're going in industry with regards to you know utilities and gas and water and communications and um, you know health and medical, uh, all of those transportation, all of those industries that um, have a direct benefit from this. Um, really with the goal to get this as, as, you know, you know, amplified throughout the state in all of our critical infrastructure sectors uh, so that it's second nature and people, you know, have it and, 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 and use it and, and then build an automation around it. So I just want to say, I'm, I'm, you know, very excited about that. Appreciative of all of you. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we've worked hard, but the hard work is yet to come uh, with regards to getting this fully integrated uh, throughout the state of California. And uh, I know it's being watched by countries around the world as well and, and what we've been doing here and uh, the interest. I think we've had, I don't know, something like a half a dozen or dozen delegations come through here in the last few months, and all of them are interested in earthquake early warning, right? So how are we doing it? What do we do? How do we bring everybody together? How do we coordinate? Um, so if there's, um, if there's impediments or challenges or, or things where we need to work together to overcome, then let's do it. Um, let us know and we'll work together to make that happen. Um, but I'm very excited about this and, and uh, I, I hope you are as well. This is really, um, you know, I, the, the last few earthquakes is really, you know, been just about the right size. We, we don't need really big earthquakes, but just about the right size to get those warnings out. And, and I know we'll learn more about that today. Um, uh, so with that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Good to see you. I'll, I'll be here for most of the um, meeting and then I have to bounce to another meeting, but um, um, very, very appreciative of all of your engagement. And please, please keep us, keep us informed, engage with us, um, invest in the direction of all of this. Um, let us know if we need to go one different direction or how we need to better uh, go in the direction that we're going into, right? This is a one team, one fight effort. We're all in this together and uh, we all have a direct benefit and it is notwithstanding just a tremendous mitigation tool. It is truly a life-saving tool. And I think that uh, you can go to bed at night's sleep thinking you've really accomplished something phenomenal uh, with this program. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Director. Uh, would any other advisory board members in the room or virtually like to make any opening remarks? Remember, if you're online, you may unmute yourself. Okay, hearing none. Uh, oh, do we have one? Sorry. So hi, this is Jack Anderson, and I I, I want to say I appreciate the, the opening remarks. One of the things that uh, I wanted to mention is, is from the San Jose quake last week is it uh, for us at the CSU, uh, we had a, a campus that was 12 miles uh, to the um, west of the um, incident. And um, it gave us, it, there was an added benefit to my shake, what is and what it was, it was the ability to review and look at the situation in real time in terms of assessing the damage on the campus, which in our case, and in in, in very fortunately, all we had was one elevator that tripped, but it, it gave us a good real time, like within several minutes, the ability to basically either escalate or de-escalate our kind of reaction. And we were able to communicate with the campus. We confirmed, a, um, a, you know, the basically the a lot of the, the, the uh, data that was coming in. And um, it was a great benefit to us, just not only in the, you know, in the right at the very moment of the incident, but actually in the aftermath immediately following. So I just wanted to make that statement. It's a great tool for us at the CSU. Thank you. We're going to get members. you on record on that, Jack. We're going to come and do an interview <laughs> with our with our team. That's great news.
Thank you. Any other opening remarks from the board members? Okay, uh, we will now move to review and approve the meeting minutes. There's a copy of the meeting minutes from the last meeting on June 29th, 2022, as well as a copy of the minutes from the October 27th, 2021 meeting in the packet received yesterday. Both were made available electronically and in person. We'll need to approve the minutes from the past two meetings as today we have a quorum. Please take a few minutes to review them and we will come back together. That moves approval of both meetings. Thank you. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Board Member Pepper. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion Aye. passes. With that, we'll discuss general program updates. We'll now turn to the Seismic Hazards Branch Chief, Jose Lara, for general program updates. Well, thank you, Derek. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, as the director has commented already, we've had a rather uh, exciting uh, last uh, month here uh, within the seismic hazards branch. Uh, in fact, we've had five real-time tests of the California earthquake early warning system. Um, and each time what we have found after, you know, pouring over the data and looking at the event itself and how we perform, we, you know, we found that the system has generally performed well. And we can see that um, specifically with the amount of my shake notifications that were sent collectively giving hundreds of thousands of people uh, you know, early warning, not only just the mice shake alerts, but also the Android integrated alerting uh, or alerts um, that have provided, you know, now we're into the millions, uh, millions of people, um, early warning of, of shaking arriving at their location. Um, all of this goes up to, you know, almost 19 seconds of potential warning that some people were able to receive. And so we are, you know, ecstatic about the performance um, of, of really the, the, the most recent um, test that the system has actually gone through. Um, just to cover some highlighted events, on September 13, there was the 4.6 earthquake in Santa Rosa, where we alerted just over, you know, 400,000 total alerts. That includes both MyShake and the Android uh, devices. In this particular event, San Francisco got almost 18 seconds of earthquake early warning. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about this later on. But we've also had multiple events um, that have occurred in both September and October um, up in our patrol in our north coast in the Petrolia. Uh, region. Um, and these events have ranged between magnitude 4.5 and 4.9 um, earthquakes. Um, and we've been able to deliver thousands of alerts um, in that area, in that vicinity, um, through both MyShik and the Android. Um, <clears throat> of course, the big event that we've had recently in October 25 was the 5.1 earthquake that occurred in San Jose. Um, and of course, this is the really when we talk about the numbers, this is the big test, right? Um, highly populated area, um, where, you know, and obviously the epicenter of the earthquake itself was very, very close to the San Jose um, region. And we were able to deliver 95, over 95,000 alerts to, um, through my shake and 2.1 million Android devices were alerted, and this is just, you know, outstanding. Um, this is a major test of the capability of the system, and we will be getting a little more in depth about it in, in a second. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, that's a perfect slide. <clears throat> uh, actually, can you go back to the Santa Rosa slide? Thank you. So our first big test was obviously Santa Rosa, and up until that point, we were 
super ecstatic about the performance, right? We poured over the data, we poured over it. And of course, there's always something that we can do to improve. But generally speaking, we saw that the system performed rather well. I've already given you some of the numbers, so I won't um, reiterate those. But what I do want to focus on is the fact that uh, post-event, uh, we do have something called our, uh, of our, we have our earned media strategy, what we call internally the rapid response, right, post-event, which is the steps and the protocol that we take post-event to really kind of um, get the message out there, not only about the California Earthquake Early Warning System, but also the MyShake app and the need for people all throughout California to download it. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the, you know, we, we immediately after the, the event um, really enacted our earned media strategy, right? Whereby we go out and try to see if we can, um, uh, you know, pierce the, um, that, the, that media barrier where we can actually put experts um, in front of the cameras to provide expert uh, uh, information regarding earthquake preparedness. Obviously the big talking point of downloading the MyShake app and in general to be able to teach people to take protective actions of drop covering and hold on. Um, we were very successful in Santa Rosa. Uh, we were able to deliver, you know, um, uh, you know, at least eight multilingual um, broadcasts um, lives, which obviously every single one turns into multiple hits within that particular um, channel or outlet, I should say. Um, and our overall earned media strategy actually netted us an ad equivalency value of over $100,000. And this is important because we really try to maximize, um, you know, all of our actions to have kind of a bigger impact, right? Kind of a force multiplier, one would say. So not only that, we were able to engage in a paid media campaign during this time that performed exceptionally well. Um, we were able to deliver, you know, almost 10,000 clicks to the earthquake.ca.gov website that teaches people not only to download the MyShake app, but also has a variety of prepared earthquake preparedness um, tips for individuals at large and industry, um, as well as how they could not only better prepare, but also potentially, you know, start, you know, planting the seed of implementing integrated um, um, protective actions within their, their business model. Um, <clears throat> most importantly, uh, a key metric that we follow is impressions. We were able to deliver in during this particular campaign over 800,000 impressions with a very minimal investment overall, which was, you know, per, you know, per our consultants was an incredibly high amount um, um, of, of impressions. So we were stoked. We were already stoked with Santa Rosa. We we got well over twenty five thousand downloads of my shake. I mean, we we saw some of the anecdotal um, um, quotes that were coming in. One that I'll cover was from the San Francisco Chronicle that talked about, and I quote: um, "Bravo to the California Earthquake Early Warning System." Uh, Twitter user Amanda Stupai wrote: "Had enough time to get my kid and I under the kitchen table. Husband had enough time to text us and make sure we saw the alert." my mind is kind of blown. And we can point to, you know, tens of these types of quotes, um, living in a new age of technology, you know, and, and that's really kind of the biggest metric for us of the success of the program, of the system that people are in fact, are receiving the alerts with enough time to take protective actions. So that really kind of drove it home for us. And then of course, um, we had another uh, real-time test with San Jose, with a 5.1 that occurred in San Jose. And, you know, we've already talked about the almost two point, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Can, can you unmute? Can you unmute? Sorry. Go ahead. Give me, before we go on to Santa, the next slide, can we go back to Santa Rosa? Sure. When you say 21,352 MyShake devices, mm -hmm. is that the actual infrastructure or... That's actually my shake uh, or, or phones that have downloaded the my shake app. Oh, phone, okay, so it's okay. devices that we say, but it's really people, oh, right? Okay, okay. But it could be like an iPad as well, right? Um, an iPad could you can download the my shake app in an iPad. And then it was four hundred thousand Android users. So that is correct. Those go automatically without the app. Correct. Okay. So Android, which I, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but I, I'm sure that I will. I will not steal any of it. Um, it's, it's actually integrated within the operating system of the phone, of the, of the, of the Android ecosystem. So nothing, there's nothing for them to do. It's already a part of, and that's really the future, 
right? That's where we want to head with even Apple devices. Get the clarification. No Thanks. problem. <clears throat> so with San Jose, you've already heard some of the metrics, 2.2, almost 2.2 million alerts delivered through both MyShake and the Android um, integrated alerting. But here's really where we hit our stride. What we've been seeing is that um, every single time that there's an event and our earned media strategy is implemented, um, we're starting to get to know some of the the the, the broadcast folks, and you know they're they they're beginning to recognize um, our 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 kind of uh, what we're trying to get at earthquake preparedness. The the app, Yvonne later on will be discussing that in a little more depth. But what we saw during San Jose is a massive media interest, right? We delivered, uh, you know, no less than 18 broadcast interviews, which is not necessarily representative of how many times they flew, right? And this covered all over the Bay Area, all over even the outskirts of the Bay Area, going into Monterey, Salinas, Santa Cruz, and that media market. And this. And I want to mention that when we say we, um, that's uh, the Cal the OES team, but uh, we've got. Uh, partners here in the audience and, and online that are also doing interviews and they often let us know when they've done interviews. So we're coordinating with them. So the number is even greater. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, Lori, you're spot on. 18 only really refers, refer, refers to what, you know, Cal OES has done. We, if we, you know, when we include the partner uh, media interest, that number grows very easily to over 40 interviews um, delivered all kind of speaking the same language about earthquake early warning, about what individuals need to do during an earthquake. Um, and, you know, most importantly, uh, obviously the, the, the drumbeat of preparedness in general. Um, so we saw a variety of news articles, written, you know, written well over 180 um, written articles. Um, you know, we'll, uh, over 200 mentions in, in general media um, wrap-ups that we were able to see, and that has carried on for well a week after the San Jose earthquake. A um, couple of key numbers for us, once again, is we saw, an, uh, you know, a rather large increase in downloads for MyShape. You know, we're, um, you know, from in a four-day period after the 25th, we saw over 166,000 MyShake um, downloads, which is an incredible, incredible number, right? Um, to touch on a couple of other things, we were able to deploy a paid media campaign as well, um, which once again performed exceptionally well with over 15,000 clicks delivered to the earthquake.ca.gov website, along with well over 2.25 million impressions in general with a campaign. So we are able to really see that our efforts are really penetrating, um, you know, uh, the population in California and that we know that our message is getting out. Um, another thing that I want to touch on really is aside from the ad equivalency, that's, you know, almost $850,000. It's really kind of more about that, that, that person, right? It's always about people and what we're seeing. And a really good example of this was um, BART, um, BART, as you know, having an integrated earthquake early warning technology was able to take immediate action um, after the alert was was issued. Um, over, oh, I'm sorry, 57 trains were currently in service during the event, and all of those trains, except for those that were in the Trans Bay tube, were placed on hold. They were placed on hold for five minutes, and that allowed, obviously. BART personnel to execute their protocol and allow for them to really assess the situation, make sure there isn't going to be a bigger earthquake soon after, and allows for them to do a track inspection, a visual inspection, to make sure that there's no consequences of the shaking with their system. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll end this section with, with this. We, you know, after the San Jose earthquake, we were all ecstatic. We saw the social media outcry, or not outcry, excuse me, um, um, uh, messaging that we were getting from people about how successful it was. But somebody, uh, actually a, a, a Californian, called um, the office of the director um, here at Cal OBS and actually um, 
talked about the California Air Curricular Warning System, and I quote, um, they stated that he had enough time to reach out to family members to prepare them, and he really appreciates all of our efforts to keep California safe. And I think that kind of, that's not just Cal OBS, it includes all of our partners that are here that have been at this, you know, for just as long. It includes everybody here in the advisory board, it includes really everybody. Um, so um, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Well, we are currently engaged in, in talking to Apple to try to integrate this, you know, life-saving technology um, into their system. And of course, you know, very much like any, any technology, you know, there's, there's a, a back and forth that, that occurs. Um, we're hoping that we see some, some movement, um, you know, soon, especially after this huge um, test that, that, you know, that the system has passed. So. Hey, Jose, uh, this is Jeff Tony in San Diego. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely, sir. So I'm assuming uh, MyShake and Android are designed uh, a little bit differently, perhaps, in the way the application was developed. Um, as you know, you know, in San Diego, we integrated the technology into our uh, county emergency application. I happened to be in San Francisco for uh, last week, and ours worked as well. And I think we had about 104 users that happened to be in the Bay Area and, and got the alert as well. I'm wondering, can an analysis be done on these different systems? And perhaps we can all learn something, you know, maybe Android's technology is better than ours or, or vice versa. I'm just curious if perhaps we can do a little deeper dive into that uh, data. That's a great flag, Jeff. We actually do have um, um, Bob DeGroo from USGS that may be in a best, the best position to kind of address that. We won't put him on the spot, but he's listening to right now and probably already thinking of something. So we'll defer that answer um, to, to Bob, if that's okay with you, Jeff. Sure, absolutely. Do you have any other questions at this time from the board? Yes. No question, just, just a comment. I would just say just really appreciate and we're talking about right. I just want to just lend a little encouragement. We lost the audio online. You got to get it closer. Oh, I have no problem getting close. All right. Um, I, I was just I'm just commenting on, on the program's approach and having a very people centered approach into how you're really trying to look at usability, how you're trying to really connect the dots between um, the things that um, could really um, make a difference in how folks um, use it and um, also share share the information and just wanted to just continue to encourage um, some very uh, people-centered um, interaction, because obviously we're talking about devices and we're talking about data, but oftentimes we forget about the actual user and the, and the folks behind it and being able to understand it and be able to share it, because the more folks know about it and comfortable about it, I know I'm the first to tell my brother and my sister and anybody next to me about a, a really great app. So just wanted to uh, just commend, commend the program team for that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Questions or comments from the board? All right, that concludes the, oh, we have one. Sorry, I was a little late on the draw on that one. Um, hi, I'm Amina from the UC. Um, I actually wrote down the question, you talked a little bit about it, but what, is there anything you can speak to about the, um, are there challenges you're facing with Apple in terms of integrating this technology? Um, all of the phones and most of the phones in the UC that we issue are um, iPhones. And so, um, and that's hundreds of thousands. And so I'm wondering, um, you talked about having discussions with them. Is there a challenge? Is there privacy issues? Or is there something you could speak to about um, kind of what the, pro what the status is in terms of iPhones? Hi, this is Lori. Apple has a different business model than Google um, is how they've ex 
explained it to us in conversations. And um, I think there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes and um, in, in uh, researching the system itself. Uh, so I would not be surprised at all if they're actively working on it. But again, that's a, a question that we best defer um, to our uh, colleague over at USGS. Um, if not for today's discussion, maybe for a future discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, just one more call out. Do we have any more questions or comments from the board? So, so this issue on the Apple Android issue is is big. Um, and there's been a lot of active discussion uh, with Apple. You know, in all honesty, I think they're they're looking at the system credibility, capability, um, because you know they they do have to do engineering. It's a little different um, than Android, but you know, we did amplify the point in the public releases from the governor's office about how many Android users got this message got this warning by comparison to people who had to download the app. We are still actively pushing to download the app on the Apple devices. And that's that's the solution in the, in the interim. But, um, you know, the message to Apple and our, our friends there that we're working with is, we got to get this done. We got to get over the finish line because that will have a massive um, a benefit to the through the system as a whole and 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 for the public as, in general there's there's uh for your point that uh, the number of iPhones that are on the street so um you know uh it's it's all part of the ongoing negotiation but we do we do really want to in the metric standpoint try to get that over the finish line here sooner rather than later thank you director and i will Call out again just to see if we have any more comments on this. All right. That concludes the general program update. Please note that we will save public comment until after the updates for system ops and research and development. With that said, we'll move into system operations updates, which will begin with a presentation from Google on Android integrated EEW alerts delivered by Google representatives Kevin Holst and Micah Berman followed by a presentation from the United States Geological Survey's Bob DeGroote, who will provide an update on the ShakeAlert license to operate process. And we will close out with Cal OES's Seismic Hazard Branch Chief Jose Lara delivering an EEW system operations update. That will turn it over to you, Kevin and Micah. Thank you. Awesome, thanks all. Can you hear me well? Great. Well, first off, thank you so much to everyone here, Cal OES, for the invite. We are honored to present what we're doing in this space. Uh, and I just wanted to give a brief overview on our social uh, impact crisis response portfolio that the earthquake early warning sits in as well. Uh, my name is Kevin Holst, and I manage crisis response partnerships on our social impact team. Uh, and the products that we work on range from forecasting to alerting during event to post-disaster analysis. We really try to look at the whole uh, multi-hazard early warning and post-disaster analysis value chain. Uh, so some of our products that uh, we work on are flood forecasting product, which was just announced uh, yesterday that we've expanded to 15 additional countries with that product on a research platform called Flood Hub. Uh, our fire boundary maps, which we have had many meetings with Cal OES on feedback, uh, providing great input. We really, really appreciate that partnership. Uh, we have our public alerts platform, which ingests uh, alerts from a government agency and directly sends them out to our users. And that is attributed to the uh, agency that sends those alerts. Our SOS alerts, which are uh, for very large events um, where we curate many different uh, great authoritative information to surface to users. And then of course our uh, Android earthquake early warning system, uh, which Micah will share about today. Uh, and last point before I hand it over to Micah, we just really value partnerships at Google uh, through all of those products, the data, 
uh, the uh, the alerts, all of these things, they are uh, really, really important um, to uh, have great partnerships with agencies around the world. Um, and Micah will talk about one of those partnerships today. So I'll hand it over to Micah. Micah is our product manager for the Android Earthquake Early Warning System. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Micah Berman. And as Kevin says, I'm a product manager at Google. One of the products that I look after is the Earthquake Early Warning System. And I'm so grateful to be able to chat with you all a little bit about that system today, um, share a little bit about how it came to be and how it works. Um, and I think the short story of everything I'm about to say is one of a, a pretty incredible partnership. Um, you know, California building out a world leading detection system and then Android uh, being able to serve as a high volume distribution mechanism for those alerts. So really grateful for your this board's leadership over the last many years and all that you've been able to achieve. Uh, next slide, please. So as you all know, uh, just uh, shared context here, I think, um, Earthquakes globally, a third most, most common and fourth most deadly disaster, and in fact, the only one of those that we can't predict. And we all know that early warnings can save lives, and that's why we're here. And that's also the same thing that interested my broader team at Google, Android Safety. Our mandate is to think about ways that phones can help our users be safe and feel safe as they go about their daily lives. And this is one of our cornerstone projects. If you go to the next slide. Before I go any farther, I also want to clarify how we position ourselves and our work here in this ecosystem. So we have built a strictly supplemental system that's able to, uh, we hope, add value for Android users by distributing earthquake alerts in the US and around the globe. But we don't, of course, view this as a substitute for any government-run official alerting system or for WIA wireless emergency alerts. Rather, we view it as an additive to those systems a way that we can provide more value for Android users. If you go to the next slide. So as uh, Jose mentioned earlier, so this, it's, this service is fundamentally built into the Android operating system. It's part of what we call Google Play Services, which is a module that's uh, deployed on basically every Android phone in the world that has Google services on it. And uh, so we can use that module to be able to turn on the earthquake alerts functionality for users. It is on by default for users. So if you set up a new Android phone and are in an area that's covered by earthquake early warning, it's on by default. As long as you have your device location setting, there's a master location toggle that must be on as well. And we need that in order to be able to send alerts to the right users at the right time. Users can opt out of this service at any time in Android settings. On most phones, it's under the safety and emergency tab. So we give users control, but we do know that many wouldn't go to opt in to this service. And since it has a potentially life-saving impact, um, it is default on. If you go to the next slide, please. So this, there are two fundamental sources of input to the system, and then they all sort of result in the same sort of output. Um, in California, as well as in Oregon and Washington on the West Coast, we're so lucky to have world-leading earthquake early warning systems already built out. So we consume an alert feed from USGS ShakeAlert, Early Warning California, via an API uh, into our server, and then use those triggers, evaluate them against our criteria, and then send out Android alerts based on those triggers. In 92 other countries around the world, we actually crowdsource this detection because they're, we are so lucky to have this really unique system here in California and on the West Coast. Most places in the world don't have it. So we can use Android phones to not only alert about the earthquake, but also to detect it um, and generate the alert. And uh, I think as was alluded to earlier as well, there's some non-trivial infrastructure that's required to be able to send a really high volume of alerts uh, to a really large number of phones in a really short span of time. And so our team has done a bunch of work over the last many years to be able to build out a dedicated alerting channel for earthquake alerts and ensure that we can deliver them to lots of phones very quickly. Um, and I will, there's a lot of engineering challenge in that that I will spare you. Um, if we go to the next slide. So our approach to the alerts that we send um, is fundamentally driven uh, by consultations with experts. So we've worked closely with experts at the USGS, at Cal OES, as well as um, Dr. Richard Allen and others um, at UC Berkeley to figure out what the right alerts are to send and what the right levels of intensity are at which to send those. 
So I'll give you an overview of how we like choose when to send which alert, and then we'll look at each alert in a little bit more detail. So overall, our system only triggers for alerts with magnitude 4.5 or higher. And then within that, we look at the MMI, the um, intensity of shaking that we expect a user to feel. And so for light shaking, MMI 4 and 5, we can send users what we call a be aware alert, which gives them information about shaking that they're likely to feel, but that's not likely to be damaging. The second type of alert that we can send is called a take action alert. And we send that to users who we expect will experience MMI 5 or greater. Um, and that's moderate to extreme shaking that could cause damage. And it's uh, a much more sort of severe alert. And so we'll take a look at each of these alert types in the next couple of slides. So next slide, please. So the first type of alert I mentioned is the be aware alert. And these are by far the vast majority of alerts that we send, right? In any event, uh, many more users will feel shaking that isn't damaging than users that are very close to the epicenter and likely to experience damaging shape. So by volume, right, this is the majority of the alerts that we send. And we expect to send a few a year per user. Um, like I mentioned, we send them for weaker light shaking. And these are just a standard notification on your phone. It's the same sort of notification you might get um, for any other app on your phone. And our goals with this alert are to let users know that they might feel shaking, give them a sense of what that'll be like, but also primarily to help build trust in the system um, so that users know that this system exists, that they can expect to receive alerts from it. And as you'll see in the next slides, we also offer some education information so we can help users understand, even if this wasn't an event that they took action for, what it would be like if they got um, a more severe sort of alert. We do find that uh, some users may take action based on this alert as well, which is great. If you click through to the next slide. The second type of alert we send, and this is a small minority, but in some ways the most critical, right? These are the users likely to be impacted by severe shaking. It's called a take action alert. And we expect the users will receive very few of these alerts. And uh, because of both the danger and the infrequency with which we expect to send them, it's a pretty severe alert. So it will ignore all of your settings if your phone's on do not disturb or silent. Um, and it will make a very loud noise. It will turn on your screen and take over whatever you're doing and present this full screen um, uh, al like alert warning, um, walking you very simply through the next step you should take, which is to drop, cover, and hold. Of course, standard advice in an earthquake. I mean, our goal is to, with this alert, keep it as simple as humanly possible. As you can see these, these diagrams we've come up with um, to uh, allow users to quickly take action. And both of these alerts and the ways that they're worded and presented are the result of uh, not only a review of academic literature that's out there and consultations with experts, but also some user research that our teams did presented, for example, various options to uh, a representative base of users to try and understand what information would be easy for them to understand how they'd like to receive it. And thus we've landed on the alerts that we have in the system today. If you click through to the next slide, both of these types of alerts, if users don't interact with them or if they're late in getting delivered, can become a different kind of alert called uh, earthquake occurred. And that's what you see here on the right. It's again, a standard notification, um, just to let users know that this earthquake happened. Um, and again, this is like a trust building exercise in the system, right? Users may be away from their phone when the event happens, come back to it hours later, and can still find that their phone was able to give them a notification um, had they been around, could have helped them stay safe. If you click through to the next screen. So uh, the, sort of we've talked about what if a, a user isn't around for an alert, we, we downgraded to this earthquake occurred state. They're gonna be sort of the opposite direction, right? Um, any early warning system is making estimates about the earthquake. And so sometimes uh, the original estimate for an earthquake will be low. And it turns out that shaking is stronger than was originally anticipated with the initial estimates that ShakeAlert or any other system would create. And so in that case, we can actually replace the be aware alert with a take action alert as long as there's time to do so. Um, and so we have built a mechanism to do that as well. Next slide, please. So both of these alerts, be aware and take action, uh, can link users then to this earthquake safety information page that you see on the far right. 
which walks users through what they can do to stay safe in the event of an earthquake. And if you click to the next slide, we'll take a closer look at that screen. So you can see our goal here is to present the most important information to users first. So uh, this is uh, their screenshots as if you had scrolled down all of the information from left to right. So at the top of the page, we have critical next steps after an earthquake, get your shoes, check gas, avoid damaged buildings, then more information on the earthquake and where it was severe, information about where you can get more information about the earthquake, and uh, for alerts sent by the ShakeAlert system, this would actually have more information. It would say the alerts were provided by USGS ShakeAlert. The opportunity for users to change their system settings and then sort of longer term uh, safety tips. Next slide, please. And any user on an Android phone can actually trigger a demo alert at any time to be able to see and feel what the experience would be like if they were to get a take action alert. So in the earthquake alert settings, right below where users can turn the alerts themselves on or off, there's an opportunity for users to click on a see a demo button. And you can see what the flow looks like. We send, uh, the demo shows the most severe notification. It shows the take action notification with drop, cover, and hold. Um, and we think actually this is a powerful tool we'd love to see, for example, integrated into uh, drills like the great shakeout. Users could practice this practice seeing the stimulus of what an alert from the system would look like, and then practice taking the appropriate protective action. And so we've had some initial conversations about the possibility of doing that. And if you click through to the next slide, I can discuss sort of briefly uh, recent events. I think actually we've, we've largely covered uh, the information on these events earlier uh, in this meeting. I think the headline here is, uh, we are really impressed with the job that the ShakeAlert California Earthquake Warning System is doing. I think uh, phenomenal work. And we are, of course, a distribution mechanism for these alerts here on the West Coast. I think we've sent just about 30 ShakeAlert-driven alerts over the years since our partnership began in 2020. Um, and as mentioned in uh, the recent event alone, we delivered just over 2 million uh, alerts to users, I think uh, our largest event in the US uh, by far. And we saw the system perform quite well. So we're, we're very happy with it. If you click to the next slide, um, I will uh, close my presentation and open for your questions in the remaining half of the time we have allotted by just saying thank you. I'm representing a small but mighty team at Google that works on this system, the vast majority of whom are residents of our great state. Um, and both as residents and as in a company that's headquartered here, we are uh, grateful for the work that you all have done and your leadership over the years. So thank you. Hi, hey, Micah. We do have one question online from one of our partners at Berkeley, and it is, how large is the Android Earthquake Alerts team? That is a good question. Um, the team that works on alert distribution, so the part that's relevant here in California, there's just, uh, there are two engineers that work on that part. There are a few more that work on the global system that does earthquake detection that uh, is not uh, relevant here in the US. I should add to that, like anything at Google, uh, it, the earthquake alert system uses many other systems at Google, and there are many more engineers that work on those systems as well. But there are two that are dedicated just to the uh, delivery of alerts like Shakespeare. Thank you to Micah and Kevin. Thank you to the team from Google. Next up will be a presentation from Bob DeGroote, who is the USGS Coordinator for Communication, Education, Outreach, and Technical Engagement and the chair for the USGS Shake Alert Joint Committee for Communication, Education, Outreach, and Technical Engagement. They'll discuss updates to Shake Alert's licensed operate process. <laughs> Mouthful. It's great to be here today. And I, I know there are a couple of areas that, that you'd like me to focus on in this presentation, but I just wanted to mention there was a question asked by one of the board members about those with access and functional needs and making uh, earthquake early warning accessible to all people. And I know that we've been working closely with the EW team here at Cal OES. Uh, we have over 30 projects going now in the social sciences to look at messaging, uh, to make uh, alerts available to people uh, across the board. 
Uh, we're continuing the work. Uh, we, we're working with university professors, with other organizations. And so is our, our vision is earthquake early warning for all, and we're going to make good on that, I promise. So, so just a, a few a few points today. Um, this is a little bit of my information. If we go to the next slide, I think what we're here to talk about today is the the building of an earthquake early warning industry. And this is actually one of the most pressing things that we have currently. That we it's in in what was said earlier by Dr. Goloducci about we're all in this together. That's absolutely true. We we really need to be working together on this. This is a really big job. And so our goal is to build this industry and to build it together. Next slide, please. So I wanna focus on the right-hand side of this slide. And what this is, is this is the connection point. The data that our technical partners, Google being one of our 12 licensed operators, and uh, I'll refer to them as an LTO, licensed operators are, are permitted uh, through a licensing process, the USGS, to distribute or to sell ShakeAlert powered products and services. And they go through an extensive testing process. So they know what they're doing. And this is actually one of the things that we're aiming to do is, is to build uh, this number of the number of folks that are able to do this. And I'll talk about a couple of different routes uh, in a bit that will explain ways that potential partners can get access to ShakeAlert powered products and services via um, either developing their own or by, um, by becoming customers of LTOs. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to share our wonderful team of uh, folks. Of course, one thing that I think was mentioned by the during the Google presentation is ShakeAlert is operational in California, Oregon, Washington. So collectively, we serve over 50 million people across the West Coast. And we have a team of folks, many of whom are focused at research universities here in California, Caltech, UC Berkeley, in Oregon, University of Oregon, and Washington, University of Washington. And we're all working together to serve uh, collectively these folks. But just because someone's in Washington or in Oregon, they're actually working with partners in California. Uh, we have two USGS people currently working on this effort, myself, and then also uh, Caitlin Nelson, who is my colleague who's based in Mountain View. And then we're hiring a third person who'll be based in Seattle. But of course, I also like to tip my hat to my colleagues here at Cal OES because we've been having some really fruitful conversations over the last several months over ways to, to work together. And I think they've been producing lots of great ideas. So next slide, please. So I mentioned there are two pathways. And um, one of them, of course, is to, to work with an existing LTO partner. And so one thing is we have documented customers of LTOs, uh, organizations who have chosen that to say, well, we just want to purchase a, um, a service, an alerting service, or we want to produce a box, something right out of the box. Imagine someday, you know, pulling up to the Shake Alert store and being able to buy boxes or devices off the shelf. Um, this is, this is the, the model that many have chosen to, to follow because of the fact that, of course, there's only uh, so much that people can do. Uh, it takes a lot of development. I think Jeff mentioned something earlier about work being done by San Diego on Shake Ready SD, which is part of the SD uh, San Diego County Emergency App. And that development process has been extensive and has, under, has been going on for several years now. And they have a fantastic team working on that. So that's one way. And then the second way, next slide, please is to develop your own, your own homemade approach. So our, our most, our newest LTO is actually in Washington. It's the Allen Science Institute, which does neurological research. They've chosen to develop their own in-house system that will allow them to alert their employees and visitors, and also to get employees and visitors away from sensitive equipment. They've chosen to take this route, but they had the resources to do that, and that's the choice that they made. And we have several partners that we've worked with that have either themselves developed their own resources or developed their own approach, or they've hired contractors to come in and help them build it and to act as a, several pairs of extra hands to, to, to put this all together. Next slide, please. So we have a list, of course, I mentioned earlier, 12 licensed operators available on shakealert.org. There's a link uh, to just a list, but then our colleagues at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, and this link is actually off of the same page with the 12 licensed operators that has what we call our, our LTO services table. And it's a much more extensive uh, list. And I know that uh, we've shared this with, with many folks, 
that, and it's publicly available, of course, that it gives information about what these different partners offer as far as, as services and products. And that's, that's, you can, anyone can go there. Next slide, please. So I, I think one of the main topics that the EEW team here has asked me to cover today is what we've done in this licensing process to streamline it. And I think one of the key parts is, is that we were at a meeting here at Cal OES back in 2018. And one thing that we learned, and of course, one thing that we knew is that we needed a much more efficient, much more streamlined licensing process. And so we've achieved that. And in fact, a lot of the big changes happened around 2020, uh, where we created a sort of one, what, sort of a, a single approach to, to becoming an LTO. Uh, one of the things that happens, I think that, that in, we've seen this happen multiple times, is that an, a partner will decide to do something. They want to choose to do some sort of application, provide some product or service, but then they decide we want to do something else. Now, as you can imagine, whenever you get into the room with legal folks, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of, a lot of red pen uh, being shared. And so negotiating agreements do take a long time. And so one thing that we did to streamline this process is that with any partner, we only execute one agreement with them and that's it. And then let's say that two years down the line, they want to do something else. So they go ahead and they just add that to the list, but they don't, we don't need to renegotiate the agreement. So this streamlining is, is it's one agreement and it's basically cyclical and they can, can use it over and over again. And that's one major piece that we've used to streamline. But of course, many of the provisions in our current agreement are not just the result of things that are requested by the federal government as far as being part of these agreements, but a lot of these provisions are driven by the partners themselves who really want to make sure that they're able to protect their intellectual property, protect their position. So these agreements are actually sort of a hybrid between the needs of our partners and our, our um, and the USGS. Next slide, please. So this is the last point. I know I only have a, a few seconds left here to talk, but again, I've been having very fruitful conversations with the EW team here, as I said, over the last several months, and I think the future is very bright. Uh, we found some really interesting ways that, that Cal OES specifically can make a really strong impact on the work that we're trying to do. Again, we, I get on the phone with Phil every week and we talk about uh, how big this job is. And I think that, that we're identifying ways that we can certainly complement our efforts. One of the things that we're doing at the USGS is that we're hiring a contractor to help us with developing a long-term, at least five years, strategic plan just around technical engagement. And so the strategic plan will be accompanied by an action plan and then whatever tools we need to make this happen. And then we'll, uh, we'll go out, uh, perhaps missionaries two by two to, to talk to folks in the community about this stuff. Next slide, please. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bob. I will uh, check here to see if we have any questions from the board. Board Member Pepper. And, and thanks, Bob, for that update. Um, I am going somewhere with this, but just to ask a baseline question, have you um, done or contemplated doing a partnership with an automaker or a, a vehicle fleet? Absolutely. And I think one thing that we, we have is that the the limit of what we can do with earthquake early warning is simply our imaginations. And so we're exploring all sorts of pathways. And of course, a lot of talk today was about alerts delivered to wireless devices. But I think that I, when my Cal OS colleagues will agree with me is that where we're gonna find a lot of the major impact is in the automated actions where humans are not involved directly. So yes, let's make it happen. Okay, great. Because I was thinking it just within CalSTO, we have Caltrans, DMV, Siege. Yes. Rail. So um, let's talk more about that then. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Chief Deputy. Dale. Hi, good afternoon. I, Director Gillard, you have to step away. So, um, so, um, I'm Tina Curry with Cal OES. I didn't introduce myself earlier, but um, but thank you, Bob, for your presentation. I know you went through a lot in a short time. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the stuff that's in their package. So there's a lot of lot more 
um, info about the license to operate process that we wanted to make sure the members were aware of so that you had um, all the background information as well as the, the kind of high level. And I think as we, um, and, and I appreciate, you know, just, um, you know, you've been here from the ground floor and sort of been through, you know, probably the first LTO is different than the 12th one, I would imagine. So there's a lot of learning, but I think, you know, I, I, I think for me, sort of being involved in this, appreciating that the LTO process provides that reliability, you know, you know, maybe standard, right? You want to know that the performance metrics can be met once you sort of release someone to go forth and do earthquake early warning, but at the same time, you know, scaling this so that it's achievable and it gets in the hands and into the automated actions as much things as possible as quickly. So that balance that we're trying to strike, I know, is what you're talking about when you're working with our team and certainly with all of you who know your sectors and what it's going to take. And um, maybe the buying the thing off the shelf makes a whole lot of sense for a lot of people that don't have the kind of want to count on somebody else who's done all the engineering. But in some cases, you know, that that self-engineering is going to make the most sense for a sector. So that that is our shared goal. And we're really going to be focusing a lot of um, effort on that sort of next stage of, of all this and getting organized. But I appreciate your um, comments and, and the streamlining that has taken place. I think that's that's going to go a long way towards the future. So. Great. Then thank you for your thoughts. I uh, appreciate that. Did you want me to mention about what's in the packet really quick, Lori, or, or whatever you want me to do? It's Sure. So a couple items. So one of the things that we've done is we've created a series of case studies. So one of the things, of course, is that we have these early adopters who are like we're really interested in doing this right from the start. But what we've done, and we're going to continue working on developing uh, case studies uh, in various sectors. So we focused on some critical sectors, of course, transportation, healthcare, utilities, education, and emergency management. And so I believe the one that you have in your packet is the transportation case study with Metrolink in Southern California. And then there are a couple of other documents that we provided relative to how to become a technical partner. And then there's also a, a handout. Is the licensing pathway in there, Phil? Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. And so uh, please uh, take an opportunity. If you have any questions, please reach out. Lori, thank you. Thank you, Bob. And um, I apologize if I missed this in your presentation. So all technical partners start out as a pilot with a pilot license agreement, so a PLA. And then uh, upon completion of their one year pilot, then they have the opportunity to to go on to license or continue in a pilot or stop. Right. So here we are um, with only 12 LTOs, and I think we all have been in agreement that that needs to be increased. Yes. Um, and of course, those 12 LTOs represent a lot more because some of them are vendors that sell to other customers. But can you tell us, if you haven't already, how many PLAs you have in the pipeline so we can kind of get in our minds, how, yes. you know, what's feeding into those future LTOs? Yes, and, and I really appreciate you amplifying on that is that there's this sort of trial and error period where they're doing research and development as a pilot licensee or PLA, as Laura referred to them, and they go through this process and they can either finish it in a, less than a year or more than a year if they need an extension. We limit our those licenses to a year, but we can always extend them, and we work with them very closely, and it's, it's a lot of really rolling up sleeves. A question about the number of, of pilots in the pipeline, it's it's on the order of 25 that are currently in the pipeline that are moving towards the, the LTO realm. And of course that number has dropped a little bit because of course some of them have become LTOs. And, and we're, we actually have a lot of really great um, leads on new ones that are coming through. In fact, I was talking to my colleague, Tal H. Come, UC Berkeley and a couple of uh, potential new pilots coming on board here very soon. That's exciting. And I know that some of them are, say, industry specific, and then some are, are um, broader in scope. Yes. Are there some areas, as you look at your PLAs and the LTOs that you have in place, um, some industry sectors, areas where we just haven't gotten into yet that maybe we ought to be focusing on? So, so we've had a lot of success with water utilities in Oregon and Washington, and so I think there's a real opportunity in California for for increasing across the utility sector. Of course, in my head, I'm always contemplating like we could expand in every direction with 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 the, of course, the five critical um, uh, sectors that I mentioned uh, earlier. 
But uh, I think that you know they're in in California, of course, utilities is a big deal, um, and um, and also we're looking at expansion within healthcare. We have a hospital in Southern California, Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles, it's involved. But geez, there could be so many more that could be involved, and we know that you you'll have lots of great ideas and and to to help us do that. So. And you have people here around the table and online that are leaders in some of those yes, sectors that's that right. we're hoping uh, <laughs> will come to the table and, and get some of this going. Absolutely. Uh, I'll do a quick check. Do we have any questions online? Okay. Uh, before we move to the next portion, I do want to introduce and acknowledge uh, Angie Gibson, Vice President, Emergency Preparedness and Response uh, for PG&E, representing as the appoint governor's appointee, representing the unit utilities industry. Welcome. And with that, uh, we will move to the system ops section, and we'll turn it back over to Jose Lara to take us through the Cal OES system ops update. Oh, thank you, Derek. So as you guys have already all heard, uh, much progress has already been made in implementing a truly comprehensive um, system statewide. Uh, network um, of seismic stations, excuse me, my, my microphone's a little broken. Um, the network of seismic stations that power EW alerts really throughout California is nearing completion. Uh, with uh, all 1,115 stations um, being already 100% funded and 907 stations already contributing to shake alert. Uh, although that's only about 81% of the planned contributing stations um, being online right now, the system is already delivering life-saving EW alerts. So we're only gonna get better from this point on. Next slide. So this will show you a, a quick um, image of the array of stations that we have throughout the state of California. Most of the stations that are left over um, that we will talk about next are in the northern part of the state um, as we covered in the last meeting. Next slide. So the queues um, build down, excuse me, for the, the system build out um, of seismic stations continues to move forward with uh, 496 um, stations already completed and 206 scheduled to be built. Uh, once all completed stations go through the user acceptance testing, um, they begin to contribute to the system um, and will add to that density of stations that we want um, throughout the state. And that's why you'll see a little bit of a different number of 206 remaining stations to be built. Um, but if you go back to the last slide, Phil, um, you'll see that it's um, approximately 208 stations to go to begin actually contributing to the network. Uh, if you want to move ahead, Bill, to the next slide. Uh, so furthermore, um, we have added more stations, um, you know, each month and since our last meeting to the state's microwave network with 15 um, added stations since our last meeting. It is important to add that during the San Jose earthquake, um, we obviously want to see if maybe one of those microwave stations were utilized to deliver the alert. But because of where that particular earthquake um, occurred, um, we found that, that none of these stations were actually utilized. And, but, and that's mainly because of the, uh, of the location of where the, or the epicenter of that earthquake, being that it was a little bit closer to a major urban setting um, obviously, the telemetry or the microwave telemetry was not necessary for this particular area. But in future events, we do expect that the that um, the microwave connected um, network will or our stations will play a pivotal role in delivering these alerts. Next slide. So, Cal OES and all of our partners, which you know, I want to highlight. You know, this this you know, Cal OES is you know plays a role here, but our partners really are the drivers behind a lot of these um, stations. And you know, we continue to proactively work with them and to address challenges that come up with any projects, specifically this one. Uh, some of the challenges that we have discussed previously are not really new to anyone. It's and it really are challenges that everyone shares in right now, which is. Obviously, the pandemic being one of them, um, we have been very proactive in working 
to immediately mitigate any impact, um, you know, because of the pandemic, but also because of any permitting issues that we have um, actually um, 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 come up with. Um, not only with the utilization of the permitting work group that um, our system operations um, teammate Dana um, has put together, but also the utilization of the board itself. Lori has been um, pivotal in delivering at least one permit um, to us through the connections that she has, um, at, you know, in, in her position. So um, we want to thank the board for their, you know, for their willingness to um, to help us when the time is needed. Um, something that I'll briefly mention is inflation um, continues to rise. We we have identified that as something that we want to kind of get ahead of and try to identify how we can best proactively mitigate any impact to our plan um, implementation, but most importantly to the system at large. At this point in time, I'll take any questions that anybody may have um, before I turn it over to Derek. What's the um, expected timeline to complete? I, I want to make sure my number was right. I'd look at my expert. Uh, 2025 is our expected um, time of completion. Okay. And once again, I do want to kind of reiterate that even though that is our expected timeline, we are already at 81% delivering life-saving alerts. So um, obviously our, we will get better from this point on. I think it goes without saying, sorry, I didn't raise my hand, um, is on the 2025, while that's like projected all things sort of being maybe the same, it's, I think it for the board, um, I'm sure I speak for you that if there's anything in this list of challenges, obviously COVID-19, it is what it is. We lost some time because of that. So did, so did many things, but, you know, we should be picking up a, um, from that now, since we're moving past it, but some, but but on the permits, things like that, I think that um, it'd be great um, to make that ask of our board if there's anything where we come across a property or some creative solution that's needed to um, to um, kind of break through something that's been um, that something that's been difficult. Then um, it'd be wonderful to, to continue to to, um, to reach out to you, and and you have been really helpful in some of those cases, and also. These are the hardest ones, you know, just like any project, right? You get the low hanging fruit. We knew that that was also going to be the case and that these last um, handful would, would, would be the biggest lift because, you know, they're hard to get to or, you know, whatever. But, um, but anyway, um, thank you, Jose, for, for highlighting those. It continues to be you know, something that's, um, that's uh, got its complications. But again, I think that's what this team is here for is to, to the extent possible to help to navigate that and um, shorten that timeline, because obviously the sooner we get to um, to full build out, then even you know better. And I'll add one other thing um, that uh, amplifying what Tina said, because these are the toughest to get to um, stations now, and weather then becomes another bullet because we now have snow on the Sierras as of last night. So there will be locations, if that continues, um, that we won't be able to get to for months. So that's just the reality of it. Thank you. I think we have one comment online. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Angie from PG&E. Uh, just curious, do we have contingency locations identified in the event that uh, we don't have the opportunity to use the primary location. So thank you for the question, Angie. Yeah, we do. The partners have you know proactively look at and have selected locations. And generally speaking, as a matter of protocol, go go you know go out of the way to kind of identify Plan Bs as a part of the process. They've been at this for a long time, and they certainly know that you know Plan A doesn't always work out. Um, so they're very good at pivoting. Awesome. Is there a way that I can get a list? Um, you know, I'd be happy to check with my uh, permitting team to see if they can provide any support where you're needing to get some of these permits. Because you, as you can imagine, all the work that we do requires the same permitting. And if we can help impart to the agency the value um, and partner in that manner, we'd love to do that. Thank you for that offer. And we will definitely connect with you on that. 
And I, I guess I would be remiss if we didn't add that in some cases, we weren't able to get our primary. So we went to a secondary and that for one reason or another didn't work either. So there's a lot of like real time, okay, we don't have this one, we don't have this one. And you know what we're trying to do is uh, kind of blanket evenly spaced these sensors, I mean, these stations, and it doesn't necessarily work out that we can have them exactly 15 kilometers or whatever from each other. Um, but we, we, there are some where we just have to keep going down the list and finding a tertiary or, you know, a fourth option. So we'll be in touch, Angie. Yeah, and I do want to kind of call out the fact that pg e is a great partner in this space. Um, you guys have all already helped us um, um, to to secure some permits in general. So um, we'll be happy to continue to. I, I know that it was like music to Dana's ears as soon as you said that. So <laughs> we have a well, it's going to take all of us. So uh, we're here to do what we can. So there have been. Um, program specific efforts to streamline permitting in different areas. And now there's, I just wanna make sure OES is, is involved in kind of the statewide one lived by GovOps and GoViz. So. Yeah, in fact, um, that's one of the key actions that we've taken in the last, I wanna say six months, probably around the time when we last met. Um, and Dana Ferry has gathered a work group uh, with all the partners to make sure that we are able to kind of come together and discuss the, the very like issues that every single partner has faced. Not, you know, whether you're in the South and Central or Northern California, you're dealing with a lot of the same, you know, either state agencies or federal agencies and or dealing with, you know, generally speaking, private landowners. And so their, their, you know, that collaboration and coordination has really helped to streamline and secure permits that have been somewhat hard to get um, previously. And so, I mean, those efforts have really kind of been fruitful. Uh, great. And through kind of broadband deployment, we've been really streamlining our processes as well as working with the um, feds on getting access to their land. So if we can be helpful for external as well. We, we appreciate that, Lori, and we'll make a note of that. And I do want to kind of call out the fact that, you know, this, this permitting work group is really a collaborative between, you know, Cal OBS, but also all of the partners, right? We are, you know, we're more of the coordination aspect of it to make sure you get everybody in the room. And obviously we do tap out, you know, members like you and our connections with other state agencies and federal agencies to kind of um, uh, help with the process. You know? Are you part of that already? Uh, transfer? I guess I guess to be more direct, I think, if, I think Lori's referring to maybe some new um, efforts at the state that are unrelated to EW that are on board that could help. So I think I think a simple thing to do after this is just make sure um, if that's okay, if we can get a rep that's familiar with those to connect with the with the permitting work group. Um, sounds like that offer and certainly if there's efficiencies we can realize by piggybacking on other processes that are already happening, then by all means, that's that's that. We'll fly. I think I'm tracking now. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, well, we we did have time baked in for discussion. Sounds like we have had a lively one. Um, I'll just do one last call out to see if we have any more for system operations. As mentioned, public comment will open after we hear updates for research and development. At that time, if you wish to make a statement, please let us know in the room or use the Q&A or raise hand feature on Zoom if you're attending virtually and the moderator will unmute you. This brings us now to our research and development section. Um, before we move on to our next presentation, I'd like to provide a brief update on a couple of prior R&D projects. Um, and actually, I think due to time, I will cover one. So we'll start with data casting. In 2017, America's public television stations in collaboration with Cal OES and USGS received a grant to create a pilot project that explores the use of PBS broadcast airways to distribute earthquake early warnings. The grant enabled five California public broadcasting service stations, which were chosen based on high population density with equipment to receive and retransmit shake alerts via data casting. The data casting receiver will detect the message and trigger automated actions accordingly. Actions can involve 
alerting the public, closing a gas valve, et cetera. This project was completed, has completed phase one with a strong proof of concept. A potential phase two would expand the project into five additional California public television stations and a station in Reno, Nevada that has a significant broadcast footprint in California. The expansion of these additional stations will grow the total population covered by the system to over 34 million residents. With that, we'll move into our next presentation for our R&D, and which that'll include a presentation on distributed acoustic sensing from Julianne Marti, the operations manager with the Berkeley Seismology Lab. Julianne, if you're ready, or is yours. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So, presentation will talk about DAS. So DAS stands for uh, distributed and uh, we'll see how this uh, DAS technology could be used to further improve the performance of the California earthquake early warning system. If we start by looking at the performance of the system as uh, Jose uh, explained uh, in his presentation, although the system is still being built, the system is not complete yet. It has been delivering alerts for over the last three years, and this in a very uh, successful manner. So if you look at, uh, I mean, this figure here, you can see that all the green disks, they represent all the, the alerts that were issued over the last uh, three years. So as you can see, there was one uh, alert delivered, and uh, that shows that the system performs already at a very high uh, level of performance. But of course, this is also our responsibility to look at maybe where the system did not perform as well as we would have liked to. And uh, so to do so, we look at two kinds of situations. The first situation is when uh, we issue an alert, but in fact, there was no real earthquake at this location. And the other kind of situation is when, oh, you bring me now. Can you hear me better? Okay, thank you. And uh, so, as I said, we look at situation where we issue an alert, but there was no real earthquake at this location. And then we look at situation when there was an earthquake and we did not issue an alert. So the first uh, situation where we issue an alert, but there was no earthquake, you can see that we had three type of uh, event like that. And in fact, it's more that there was an earthquake, but we did not manage to locate it uh, so accurately. And for the, the alert, I mean, the earthquake that we missed, in fact, you can see, so those are the orange disks on the figure. They are all located at the edge of the network. We had one event in Mexico, one at the border with Nevada. And we think that we, we understand quite well why this happened. And, uh, and we think that we have corrected uh, that since, I mean, that we have made update to the system to avoid that in the future. But there is still an area in California where we have a certain, um, a reasonably high number of false and missed alerts. And that's this area offshore of uh, Northern California, which is called the Mendocino Triple Junction. And uh, it's called like that because that's a jun junction between three seismic uh, tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, that's a very seismically uh, active uh, area, as you can see. And uh, I mean, the main uh, offshore uh, seismically active area in California. The, I think out of the of the the ten earthquakes with the highest magnitude over the last two hundred years, two were out of this area, with a magnitude seven point three in nineteen eighty and a magnitude seven point two in nineteen ninety two. So that's why it's really important to try to to better uh, uh, estimate the location and the magnitude of the earthquakes in this area. Uh, the issue is that in this area there is no island, so we cannot really install seismic stations, 
uh, close to the to, to this area. So all the stations they are uh, on the coast of uh, of California. So when you have a, an event on land, the wave propagates in all direction. So it's quite it's relatively easy with all the stations around to locate the event properly. But in that case, because all the stations they are along the coast, when the event arrives, all the station points to the same direction, and then it's it's a, I mean there are more uncertainties. On, uh, on, the, on estimating the, the location of this event. And then if there is uncertainty on the location, then we will also misestimate the magnitude of the event. And this is why you see all this, uh, all this orange and red uh, disks. Um, and the other issue is of course, because the event offshore, it will take time before the signal reach the coast. And then we can measure uh, that there is an earthquake happening. So there will be an increased latency compared to the event that would happen uh, on land. So we are investigating two kinds of solutions. The first one is to try, I mean, and both these solutions, they are complementary. The first one is, uh, is, uh, is through machine learning. And in fact, we, we made uh, quite a lot of progress with that. We're about to publish a paper that by using basically, I mean, that's not the content of the presentation today, but just in one sentence, uh, by using past information about the earthquake in the area, we are able to better constrain the location of the earthquakes in real time. So that's one option, but uh, that doesn't solve the fact that still it will take time for the signal to reach the coast. So another solution, of course, will be to try to have measurement system uh, offshore, in fact. So to extend the measurement system offshore in order to be able to detect those uh, the seismic waves much, uh, much faster. And uh, one technology to do that is to deploy ocean bottom seismometers. So that's... Uh, it's a very common uh, technology in the oil and gas industry, but uh, also uh, there were a lot of uh, experiment for uh, scientific, uh, different scientific purposes. The, the, the main drawback is that usually this is all done in the case of uh, temporary experiment. So you deploy a seismometer at the bottom of the ocean with some uh, power system, and then you come back three months or six months after to retrieve the equipment. So that's not applicable for a, for a real-time system that needs to... Uh, to, uh, to distribute data within uh, milliseconds. And uh, so there are some kind of solution where you can put at the surface of the ocean some kind of solar panel with some kind of radio transmission to try to transmit this data in more or less real time. But again, this, is, this kind of system have too high latencies for application that would not work for us. On top of that, those systems are very expensive to install because you need a lot of ship time, the equipment itself is very expensive. And every time there is an issue with one of these devices, you have to go back with the ship, pull the sensor out of the ocean, repair it, installing back. I mean, that's, that's a very interesting technology that provides, I mean, excellent data, but that's an expensive technology. So the other uh, technology we have been looking at is, uh, is distributed acoustic sensing. So distributed acoustic sensing is basically using fiber optic. So usually you would use a fiber optic to transmit information from one point to another one. But that's, uh, that's using the same fiber optic not to transmit information, but if you send a laser pulse through the fiber optic, uh, you can in fact uh, collect information about the environment. And so this, I mean, I think, the, the first experiment, they were about 20, 25 years ago, and we realized that we can measure, we can make very quite accurate temperature measurements using fiber optic. And as the technology evolved, about 15 years ago, we realized that we can, through a kind of different mechanism, we can measure not only temperature, but also strain. And strain is much more interesting because it can relate more to some kind of pressure measurement. And especially if your cable is uh, has a good coupling to the ground, you can, uh, you can relate that to ground velocity measurement. So that, th those kind of systems were used uh, for many applications. I mean, the main one was really to monitor, uh, to, to, to deploy fiber optic along the, the, the pipelines to, to monitor uh, uh, for, for security reason or to monitor links, leaks along this, uh, this pipeline. But about 10 years ago, as the technology again evolved, we realized that it could be used also to, to monitor earthquake. And why this is interesting in our case, it's interesting because in fact, uh, there are a lot of uh, offshore 
uh, fiber optic cable across the world. And as you can see here, uh, we have especially many cables going out of the coast of California. So of course, if we could uh, use some of this cable, we could also uh, monitor earthquake, not only onshore, but also offshore. And usually in these uh, in this big fiber optic cables, most of the fibers are used to transmit information, but usually there are some left for a spare, and those are unused fiber that, uh, th that would constitute a great opportunity for us to, to monitor earthquakes. Um, so in order to, um, uh, to better test this technology, we sign a partnership with the Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Research Institute. And the reason is that they operate a number of sensors, temperature sensor, pressure sensor, and video camera, about 52 kilometers out of the Monterey Bay. So that's the cable you see on the, on the map. And, uh, and what's interesting is that they have fiber optic to transmit information from, this, uh, from their sensor to the coast, and they don't use all the fiber optic. So they let us use one of these fiber optic to plug our DAS system onshore to that fiber optic, which means that uh, we could sense uh, data all along this uh, 52 uh, kilometers. Uh, so that's just so in the on the picture you see the the black rack install which we install our equipment so the that's the main piece of equipment is called an interrogator that's the piece that sends the cable that was installed into this container on the shore and you see uh, a few pictures of the the cable and the water as well I mean most of the um, over most of the past the cable is now buried by sand or under mud but there is still a few sections where you can see the the cable. So we installed this equipment in July uh, this year. And what's very, very interesting is that technology is that you can have many measurement points all along this cable. So just over, I mean, just this cable, which is 52 kilometers, we can have more than 10,000 measurement points all along that cable. So just to, to give you a, a perspective on that, as, as uh, Jose uh, explained uh, earlier, for the entire California, we plan to have a little bit over 100, 1,000, sorry, 100 stations to for the entire Q system. But with that single cable, with one single piece of instrumentation, you could have 10,000 measurement points that would correspond to seismic station all along this cable. Of course, we don't need all this data for earthquake early warning, but we are, so the, the main, the first challenge was really to try to stream this data in real time because all these systems, they were not designed for such real time applications. So over the last months, we have developed some software to stream this data within a few hundreds of milliseconds to our data center at UC Berkeley. And now it's put together in the same data buffer as the seismic data. Um, so I just have one figure to explain you a little bit what we can record with a DAS. Uh, that's, uh, so so I, will, I will start by describing the, 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 the figure with uh, red and blue. So on the X axis, you see the time. On the Y axis, this is the distance in kilometer. And so the zero at the top uh, is the point where the cable is connected to the shore. And at the bottom, the 52 kilometer is the end of the cable. So the zero to 52 kilometer represents the length of the cable. And on the horizontal axis, you have the, the time, the time scale. So that's at the time of an earthquake, a magnitude four earthquakes. And each of the line, horizontal line, in fact, represent a measurement along the cable. And uh, so when it's white, it means there is nothing. And when it becomes a darker color, like red or blue, it means that the, the cable detects some shaking. And if you take, I mean, I've just taken some of this line and plot them, so in black on the side. So, uh, so and you, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with looking at seismic signal, but basically each of these measurements is very similar to what would have been recorded with a seismometer with the different seismic arrival. And, uh, and uh, so that figure on the left, represent the 10,000 signal on next to each other that, uh, that, that, that I mean, 10,000 similar signal at those that you can see in black on the side. Um, so this uh, uh, two months after we installed that cable, we already detected more than 30 earthquakes thanks to that cable. It's also a very interesting area to have uh, to do earthquake monitoring because the cable go over uh, a seismic fault that had uh, historically one magnitude seven earthquake. 
in terms of R&D, I mean, the, the main topics we focus on right now, the first one is to really assessing the, the detection capability of that cable. The second one is to be ready a, to be able to process the data from that cable together with the data from the onshore station in order to be able to be even faster and better at locating uh, earthquakes in this area. Um, so, I mean, again, I, I just took one example for this presentation today, but that's really a booming technology. There are many other research institutes that work uh, with that technology. We have our colleagues from Caltech, for example, today as well. They have also access to cable on, lands, uh, on land uh, because that this is also a technology that could uh, really help uh, increase the sensor density in uh, urban areas, for example, where it's difficult to install, install a lot of seismic station, but we have a lot of fiber optic that run through cities. So that's also very interesting uh, for urban areas. We also have our colleagues from the USGS that run a number of temporary experiments in Northern California. So there is an entire research community uh, working on that. The only reason why I took that example is because that's an example of an offshore application. And this is one of the area which is really interesting for improving the, 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 the performance of the of queues in, uh, in Northern California, especially. So as a, as a conclusion, uh, we think that DAS is a, cost, uh, is a very cost efficient technology to extend seismic monitoring offshore and uh, beneath uh, urban environments. Uh, we, we are convinced that it can improve the performance of uh, both earthquake and tsunami warning system. We are right now trying to integrate that technology within the existing, uh, I mean, uh, with the existing accused uh, processing pipeline. Something also I, I did not mention too much during the presentation that's a very rapidly evolving technology. I mean, four years ago, we could only sense maybe 10 to 20 kilometers along a cable. Then it moved to 50 kilometers. Now the new instrumentation, they can sense 100 kilometers. We think that by next year, they will be able to sense 200 kilometers offshore. So it means as the technology evolves, we will be able, if we have access to some cable, we will have to really an increased capability to sense, uh, to detect earthquakes offshore. And finally, I mean, so we think that the, the main challenge of this technology is to have access to cables, so offshore cables especially. And uh, we, we, we are having discussion with different kind of partners. I think that's the, the, the same for our colleagues from Caltech. But uh, in order to, to be able to uh, get, bring offshore data within queues, we'll need to have access to these offshore cables. Thank you very much. And we'll look to see if we have any comments. Deputy okay. Director Measure. Thanks. Um, so I have two questions. Sorry, this sciencey stuff I find extremely fascinating. Um, could you go back to the slide that has the DAS representation? Thank you. You mentioned that there are 10,000, essentially 10,000 sensors compared to like the three that would be represented by actual stations. So I, I just want to put that kind of in the vernacular. With DAS, we can get te almost 10,000 to one, essentially. So for every one station we, we could build on land or anywhere. Um, a, a fiber optic cable gives us the capacity of 10,000 of those. Yes. For, of course, for earthquake early warning system, you don't need one sensor every five meters. So for example, we plan probably to use, to only uh, take into account one measurement point every kilometer or two kilometers along that cable. Now we collect all this data to, to be able to better understand the cable capabilities. But for real-time processing, we might only use a reduced number of these channels. That leads into my second question, which was the data, because it was my understanding that this particular technology yields so much data that storage capacity and, and the ability to do data analytics is then uh, overwhelmed. But it sounds like you, one of the ways that you are trying to solve that is not to use all the data that comes out of the cable, but just to 
to take it at certain points. Is that correct? Yeah. No, that's a, that's an excellent question, and that's exactly true. Uh, in fact, uh, what we are trying to do is to optimize the way we use the cable, which means that we do something a little bit different from taking just a few points along that cable. We try to, in real time, this is what we do at the place where we record data, we try to take a number of channels around a certain measurement point and process it in a way that you get an even better response for the system, but you group that into one single signal at several points along that cable. And those are probably these 10 uh, signals that, are, that corresponds to signal of 10 seismic station that we are right now streaming in real time to our data center and trying to process together with the rest of the seismic data. That's the research part, how to uh, do, I mean, basic, uh, I say basic because it has to be very fast, but signal processing in order to get the best uh, data out of that cable for earthquake early warning purposes. Thank you. And I also want to mention, kind of just reiterate that this and Caltech's uh, similar project are being funded through um, the California Earthquake Early Warning um, Program. And for those of you that may represent uh, agencies or entities that have fiber optics that have some dark fiber that we could potentially utilize for this purpose, yeah. see that, see, well, see us, we'll put you in touch with all the people you need to talk to. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I would, uh, we would, I think we both, I mean, uh, Caltech and us, we'd like to thank the, the Cal OES for funding uh, uh, that, uh, that research. We get postdoc funding for that. The experiment uh, at Embari was also partially funded through the National Science Foundation, but this was only for a year. And now we are planning to extend this partnership with Embari in order to secure access to that cable over a very long time period. And Quick question, I hope. Um, thank you, Dr. Marty. Does, does um, this project or this research have potential um, promise for like a Cascadia subduction zone? And if so, are you also talking with Washington and Oregon about um, interest in yeah, sure. this? And uh, they, they, they also run their own experiments. And uh, yes, we are talking to them, of course. I think the, they face the same challenge as us is to try to get access to cable permanently. Um, but another option, of course, for all of us, will be to, because that will be still much cheaper that ocean bottom seismometer, will be to think at some point, if there is a specific area of interest, we could deploy our own fiber optic uh, with a certain shape that will be very uh, suitable. And uh, because again, that does not require any power uh, underwater and all that, you just lay the fiber optic, you sit there, then you plug your instrumentation offshore and then you will be able to send. So there is two paths forward. Of course, the, the, the easiest would be to have access to existing cable, but uh, worst case scenario, I think that would be also, I mean, I think that's not worst case. Worst case is the ocean bottom seismometer technology, but we could, uh, we could also think about uh, deploying our own cables offshore. Thank you. And we have a question online. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is, I, I agree, this is uh, incredibly fascinating. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the Friends of the Pleistocene um, field trip event this last year with my geoscience team. And um, Mark Hempel Haley from Cal Poly Humboldt shared a similar experiment that they did up there um, in Arcata. Um, yes. Just a couple questions. Um, is, uh, is the DAS, more sensitive than our current instrumentation? I mean, it, it depends what kind of instrumentation because on land we have very different kind of instrumentation. I think mm -hmm. the question is in that case, uh, I mean, in the case of an earthquake early warning system, you're not looking at trying to detect very small earthquake because they, those will not, uh, will not have any impact on uh, populations, mm -hmm. or, uh, infrastructures. So we think that, and uh, as I showed with all the earthquakes we already detected with the cable, for the kind of magnitude we are interested in, 
the cables can see uh, all the, I mean, over a certain area, the cable is uh, sensitive enough, yes. Yeah, I guess I, maybe I should answer, ask the question better. Um, would it be able to sense the P waves giving us more time in the earthquake early warning than um, instrumentation that we use today? I don't think it will give us more time in the sense that it will not detect uh, better or worse. It's just the fact that it would be potentially closer from the epicenter of the earthquake if the event will be, I mean, closer to the cable, that will give us uh, a much reduced warning time just because the cable could be closer to the epicenter of the earthquake. But a seismometer or, a, or the cable would detect the both P and S arrival more or less in the same way. Okay. And then um, would this technology also help us identify any unmapped faults? Yeah, and that's, that, that's an excellent question, in fact, because, for example, uh, in the case of this uh, cable at Embari, so you see the cable go over, over the fault in red, which is called the San Gregorio fault. And uh, in fact, we realized that thanks to the cable we detected uh, over the last two months, a small earthquake along that fault that we could not see with the regular system, which is onshore. So we had only one onshore station that detected that event. So because we need at least four to trigger an alert, I mean, the regular system did not trigger any alert, but if we would have used data from that cable, we will have located an earthquake on that fold and we might have triggered an alert depending on the magnitude of the earthquake. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good example of uh, how this cable can allow extending and monitoring of offshore faults. Great, thank you for that. And um, and I didn't know if you were aware that the Cal Poly Humboldt team had finished their experiment. So there may be an opportunity for you all to ex, you know exchange notes. Yeah, in fact, we worked with them on that experiment and we installed uh, four uh, broadband seismometer along that cable. So we were part of that experiment. Oh, but, great. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, we worked together with our colleagues from the USGS and the Humboldt University. And so UC Berkeley was also part of that experiment. Yeah, the the uh, briefing that he gave at the at the FOP was uh, really really fascinating and, and exciting. It's really great technology. Already, as I said, there is a lot of experiment uh, going on by all our colleagues from California, the rest of the U.S., across the world. This was just one example of experiment today, and uh, focusing especially on the on the on an offshore example. Thank you, Julian. I'll do a quick check. Any other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, uh, public comment is now open. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. If you're in the room, there is a microphone at the podium. Okay, hearing none, uh, next we will move into the finance section of the meeting. Uh, and next to present will be Lori Najur, Deputy Director for the Planning, Preparedness and Prevention Directorate here with Cal OES uh, with EEW finance updates. Lori. Thank you. So last time we met, I believe was on the day that the budget was passed. So we didn't have uh, all the information, but we had just received good news that the earthquake early warning budget was approved. So here are the details. Next slide, please. We now have uh, $17.1 million ongoing general fund approved. Uh, so that means uh, what prior to this time we had been receiving one time general fund um, every year. And now we have something to look forward to that we can uh, now build uh, longer term uh, planning efforts off of. Um, this provides ongoing reliable resources for our core earthquake early warning functions. Um, that would include staffing, um, operations, education and outreach, and research and development. Um, that includes our um, contracts with uh, our partners, 
for the system operations and maintenance. Um, we got two new staff in the earthquake early warning unit, and we got one new PIO dedicated to earthquake early warning. Um, this will also continue to fund our telemetry project, uh, which is hooking stations up to the uh, state microwave network. Um, and this uh, provides primary telemetry in certain rural parts of the state and then secondary telemetry for others. Uh, we'll continue our education and outreach. And um, as you just saw here, research and development uh, as new technologies become um, known to improve the performance and the reliability and the resiliency of the system, um, then we can take a look at pilot projects and, and um, other things. So uh, any questions from the board on our budget allocation? Thank you, Lori. Uh, at this point, uh, well, let me check one more time. Any questions from the board online or in the room? All right, at this point, we'll open up discussion for any public comment. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. Okay, we will move to the next item on the agenda where the EEW Research and Development Lead, Phil Labra, will present the goals for EEW sector-based implementation. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so far, you've heard about the recent successes of EEW in California, updates from our staff and partners on current projects and continued uh, initiatives such as uh, streamlining the process for the LTO recruitment, as well as new technology that we've uh, recently heard. But where do we go from here? With the EEW system statewide nearing completion, we're looking forward to continue laying the groundwork for continued and future growth while making sure scaling is, excuse me, is possible, especially with EEW uh, protective automated actions in critical sectors. We're looking to work with our board members, partners, and stakeholders to build on the successes of existing sector implementation. Uh, there's a lot of great examples in the meeting packet that was provided, along with the case studies that uh, USGS provided. We're also focusing on goals that will help to expand EW to include and incorporate private sector government entities and critical infrastructure providers. In the coming weeks and months, we'll be focusing on the automated responses and features that employ EW technology that are scalable and improve safety. We'll be developing an action plan, as well as a series of pilots in partnership with our board, local, state, and federal agencies, which will provide defined phases, schedule and time frame as well as processes and technical assistance in order for us to scale and measure future expansion in overall statewide adoption. Our plan and approach will be organized by the group sectors for phased implementation. Uh, we've identified the following key sectors, uh, first responders being the first, re and please refer to the fact sheet that we've included in your meeting packet. You'll find a quick a uh, quick description of the sector, the various types of automated actions that can be applied, that can be applied, as well as a summary of benefits and outcomes. Next, we have transportation, very similar to Metrolink and BART, and education that includes our K through 12 and higher education. Additional phases will include is government facilities, healthcare, and utilities, as well as public gathering venues, financial institutions, telecommunications, uh, factories and manufacturing, as well as private businesses and commercial buildings. Now, this is just an outline of uh, our upcoming efforts with more details to come, but the intent of sharing this with you is to ultimately gauge your reactions, to hear your feedback, 
and listen to your questions and your recommendations, uh, which leads us into the next slides, our discussion with our board members. Question, uh, what are the challenges that constrain or delay EEW implementation? Uh, uh, or in other words, what gaps exist in your areas that we can begin to address? I'd just like to remind all of the virtual attendees to please utilize the Q&A section to type in any questions, not the chat feature. I think this is a really good question to get the conversation going for the board. Um, specifically, we want to kind of point out that that everybody represents a different area, um, uh, you know, different sectors, and really want you guys to kind of focus in on that a little bit um, to kind of really dig in if there is any constraints or gaps that may in fact be the assembling block or a challenge for us um, in integrating, um, you know, these protective actions within each sector. Lori? So I think there's a challenge, but that uh, also lends itself quite nicely to an opportunity that we have based on a, a proven program that, that we've done, which is, you know, you're talking about Metrolink, you're talking about right transit and rail. Um, the state, depending on how you count, has between 600 and 700 different transit agencies. Um, they are all independent. And so, um, what we have done in order to kind of bring them different functions and, and services is we've utilized um, uh, master services agreements and just created a statewide one off of which they can purchase because procurement is a huge challenge. Um, many of those transit agencies uh, outside your urban areas have three or four people that work there. So even if your title is general manager, you're driving a bus. So nobody has time to do that. So we're trying to take that away from them. Um, we've worked very closely with our partners at AT&T um, and actually I believe today announced um, a new partnership on FirstNet where we created a package to serve a specific function. I think there are, if we can figure out what packages might look like and kind of talk through that, if you're looking right at specific industries or specific um, entities creating um, a statewide package off of which anybody can purchase. And I'm not thinking just transit, I'm thinking really just in general, if we figure out what those are and we make them available um, through statewide MSAs, I think that's an easier way to push it out because doing individual procurement contracting efforts, um, kind of building by biz building or business by business, um, streamline that procurement process, I think we'll get a lot farther, a lot faster. Thank you. Any other comments online or in the room? We did make in a lot of time for discussion. So I know there's been a question. This is Angie from pg and &E. I know there's been a question about the ability to uh, include automatic shutoffs on utilities. Um, you know, from an electric perspective, we have a incredible uh, penetration of SCADA devices, the super supervisory, uh, um, <laughs> um, I'm like losing the acronym and I say it every day. So, <laughs> um, supervisory control and data acquisition, there you go. Um, so what we observed in Napa was that with the Napa quake was those functioning very well, where um, they automatically uh, de-energized circuits and circuits rolled up to the main breakers, um, which is you know exactly what we want to see in those areas that are um, experiencing the most shaking. Um, with the gas system, we have to be really careful about false positives and, and um, too much sensitivity. It's really important to be able to find the sweet spot there because once those gas valves close, then the activity of having to repressurize the systems and relight pilots 
Um, you know, when we perform a pilot relight, it it's not it's not like turning on electric. You have to we have to enter the home. We have to do a safety check of all the appliances. Roughly it takes about twenty minutes per home to relight pilots. And so for something like that to be successful, it'd be really important for us to be able to find the sweet spot with, um, you know, Mercalli scale integration and, you know, the risk of fire following and things like that. Um, so, um, you know, including, you know, how much early warning notification we've got, right? Were we to integrate that with EEW, I think it's going to be really important um, for us to understand that right now we're getting like two to 10 seconds, right, of earthquake early warning. And so just really kind of, I know it's an easy solution to, to search for. It's just something that we, I think we have to be really sensitive about how do we find the right spot for that? Um, and so um, those are really some of the things from the industry that we're thinking about. Um, we have installed a lot of um, telemetric devices on the gas system already, which we did not have during Loma Prieta. We also, um, we had more of them um, for Napa and we have even more now. And so with gas control already monitoring the system for uh, disruption in um, changes of pressure and things like that, um, our ability to manage that risk is very strong right now. Um, so those are just some of our thoughts from the industry. Um, obviously customer and community safety is the number one. And so that's how we're gonna be looking at improving these systems going forward. Hi, Angie, this is Lori. So um, I understand what you're saying in terms of like uh, major lines, gas lines. What about like at individual homes? Would it, would it be uh, kind of an alternative to, to have gas lines at or valves at individual homes that shut off? And I understand that once it shuts off, then generally... Um, a technician needs to come out and turn on the pilot, but it seems maybe less invasive, um, less number of homes impacted. I, I, I think, yeah, no, and, I, and I'm here, I hear what you're saying, Lori, and I think it's, you have to look at it through the same lens, because whether you shut off a, a larger distribution system, or you shut off 50,000 customers in an urban center that were fed by that distribution system. Does that make sense? So you could have the same impact. So I think you have to look at it through the same lens. Now, there is some technology that's coming available by adding accelerometers to the smart meter system, which would provide that, that opportunity. And I think um, our, our community members and customers have the ability right now to get an accelerometer and put it on their gas meter. Um, and, you know, like I said, their safety is the most important. We just need to make sure we can find a technology that um, ensures their safety, but also doesn't overactivate and give those false positives because then it's not only impactful to them. And then they start to not rely on that as a safety measure. And that's, I think, one of the concerns that, that we have for that. It's like over notifying through an alert system. Hi, this is Tina, just to kind of um, build on that and Angie's point. And obviously, you guys have put a lot of thought into it, which when we expected, it, like it's going to depend, right, on each sector what makes sense, what is the most safe thing to do with EW versus causing uh, more problems. Um, um, and that's going to depend. And so I think, you know, you don't have to answer it now, but I think one thing in this sort of topic area for the members to think about is if there are gaps, like knowledge gaps, or, you know, maybe. My sector just doesn't know what we can do with this technology. We need to spend more time or do some research to get into the specifics. I think it's, you know, for transportation and transit, there was a lot of 
history, you know, other countries and training, you know, it's kind of like a, there's a, already kind of a tolerance for maybe trains slowing down and stopping because it probably happens every day. And um, but some of this is really new. So if there's um, gaps in sort of how we um, kind of contemplate what the benefits are down to, you know, more of a sector detail that that would make sense, too, if that's a barrier. Right. People just don't know what they can do with it other than obviously for your employees. Um, you know, downloading the app and having the cell phone technology that's already available. But beyond that, um, there just may not have been an opportunity yet to do the, you know, kind of uh, to kind of match make, you know, here's what EW can deliver and here's what I as a sector can use with it. And maybe that's, you know, kind of one of the initial things that needs to happen more. I don't know. That may not be the case. I just kind of put it out there and see if if there's a step one that's something like that, then we should we should, you know, kind of understand that and and plan for that in this as we sort of uh, branch out into this sector. Bring it in close and bring it in close. Um, just really appreciate this, this the discussion around and um, under Secretary Curry, I really appreciate how you articulated the fact that it's, it's very vast, it's very broad, and it can be also very customized. And my my comments, um, obviously, within our agency, we're split into two. We have a housing side, and then we also have a consumer side. So I'm, I'm thinking about both hats here. And so my comments may be best suited for the education and outreach piece, but I think there's a tie. Between the first two phases that I saw, housing wasn't necessarily one of them, not because it hadn't been thought of, but it's it's very similar to deputy director, but you were bringing up around you know electricity and homes. I appreciate Angie's comments from PG&E, but from a housing perspective, I'm thinking about you know the property managers. I'm thinking about housing service coordinators, folks who want to provide more information to to a variety of different folks, especially in low income areas where there's a lot. Um, housing assistance where there's a lot of um, vulnerable communities that are looking for resources. So as it relates to different ways and how to get the word out um, from a housing perspective, education, outreach, I, there's some things that are going in my mind. And then also, um, so it's very different from the implementation perspective, but on the other side, same thing with consumers, right? Because we have such a you know, vast reach of over 4 million different licensees, professional licensees across the state, you know, from nurses to doctors, you name it, um, where there's just, there's really a lot of great opportunities, I think, as my colleague Frank just said, that we can build off of some challenges there, but definitely a lot more opportunities we can. So um, I can build upon that more when we get to the next agenda item, but just wanted to just uh, to share kind of the nexus of where at least our agency could be thinking about this. Thank you. Um, I think that's a, you know, I think you're you're spot on the fact that your your particular agency is really uniquely positioned to really kind of help us with that. Um, and you know, I know you mentioned that 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 um, you know you your your game for for getting involved. We are going to be keeping that in mind and kind of propose some things specifically targeted um, at your agency that may help kind of get the word out. So really appreciate your thoughts. And some of the things that we already have in place um, for, and you can think about maybe how this could be implemented through regulation or, or some other way. Um, there are uh, earthquake early warning vendors and that have products that run through the radio that could be mandated in, you know, low-income housing or whatever that provide the earthquake early warning. Um, there's also we did we talked about our data casting um, that goes through the television. Um, it's a right now it goes through a box that's connected to the television. So again, another kind of ancillary device, but in the near future, that uh, actually may be integrated into televisions themselves so that every television could get the signal. And if we equip the public and even private um, television stations with this capability, then it can go into every home. So there's a lot of you know things that either exist now or will soon that could potentially be utilized in your sector. 
And I, we do have a couple of other questions, I think, as part of this presentation. And I do want to keep the conversation going, but let's try and get those out and hear, hear more on the subject. Sure. Thank you, Derek. So the second question is, are there other sectors or sequencing that may lend to better adoption of EEW technology? So in other words, if we throw up that slide again, that kind of had our phases, three phases, are we missing anybody or any, any sectors or should we move, move them around a little bit? So this is um, a thought I've been having kind of during this entire discussion. I think I, in my notes, put it a few times of, um, a potentially easier adoption is the state itself and our facilities and our services. Um, and so I was also considering, should we discuss potentially expanding the board now that we're moving into this type of direction to include GovOps, which has DGS and CDC procurement ones, but also um, you know DGS with all of the buildings and CDP, their um, you know technology role in our in our state government, and um, I, I just believe very strongly in leading by example and showing what can be done, and potentially working out some of the kinks um, with ourselves as well. So maybe moving government up to number one. Could could be yes, and we have had uh, initial conversations with DGS. Um, and hopefully it sounds like they're on board with helping us do this. Well, and I think within this list, we probably have state government that sort of, you know what I mean, kind of does all these things in some form or fashion too. So I think that's a, that makes a lot of, um, makes a lot of sense and really kind of touches on a lot of these areas anyway. Um, when you, when you look just cause we just have, you know, big state and, and uh, lots of functions. So, and when we, when we reference government facilities, we're not just talking about state facilities. We're talking about local government buildings too. Um, we've we've had initial conversations with like um, emergency managers regarding getting it into all the EOCs, the emergency operations centers, um, which of course we can do at the state level too because we have all the department operations centers as well. And um, we we've talked about. Um, getting it into the PSAPs, the, the public safety answering points and others, um, and those are locally run. So um, unfortunately there's like not necessarily one group that's over them all. It's a bunch of different conversations. <laughs> I think that's something that's to, to kind of mention is we look for force multipliers. Right, it's a, it's relatively speaking, it is a very small team for a very large state. So anywhere where you feel that we can, you know, if we go to, with this organization or this particular agency where you think that we may be a force multiplier, such as GovOps or you know, of course we, you know, DGS are our, our partners. And that's kind of what we're looking for. Everybody, on, you know, online and here is anywhere where you can kind of potentially have this genius idea. We, we would appreciate it. All right, I believe I, there, uh, yes. Just one quick uh, comment as I think that the list is pretty comprehensive. I, I don't see any areas that would be missing. Uh, as we look at adoption, um, I think it's also just awareness. Uh, it's hard to adopt if you don't know about it. And I know that there's a huge effort around uh, the great shakeout in October, um, but is there more of a focus that we can do year round? Um, because when we think about the number of uh, my shake alert apps that have been downloaded for a state this size, it's a drop in the bucket. Absolutely. And we will have at the end of today's meeting, we'll have a presentation regarding shakeout and maybe, you know, future opportunities for um, outreach and education. But I want to throw it out there, if you have um, either departmental or um, um, you know, a 
association meetings where they're talking about public safety and you want to invite somebody from the team or you want us to provide you with the materials to make a presentation to this group regarding earthquake early warning, we are more than happy to do that. Thank you. And Phil, if there's... Okay. Thank you so much. And our final question to the board. What does implementation of EEW technology look like in your industry? With multiple seconds of warning before shaking, what automated actions could be modified or employed to improve safety and resilience? Again, um, if there's anything to add on either of the questions, uh, all three that have been posed, uh, now's the time uh, if you're online. Yep, if you're online, please just unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. I just didn't want to step on somebody. <laughs> so I think um, I think we're I, I shared from an industry um, what we're what we're doing and what we're concerned with. You know, I think Tina brought up a really interesting question there, and I think we could um, we could potentially look at um, what's the geology of the service territory or of the state. And then look at rather than um, a full blown auto shut off, we could look at maybe some kind of targeted where in areas where we have significant liquefaction, for example, that poses the most risk. And so how could we incorporate um, processes, procedures a little bit more surgically? And so that's something that I'll take away from the meeting and um, have a discussion with our geoscience team um, and our IOU partners to the south and see um, what their thoughts are about that. Um, we are a little, a little behind with our execution of some of our pilot projects because of shifting headquarters from San Francisco to Oakland. And so we're gonna be looking at implementing um, what we had planned to do in San Francisco here at the Oakland General Office. So that would be the PA system announcements that are automatic, as well as the elevator pre-staging based on the EEW messaging. Um, we're also looking at the opportunity to connect EEW with our company radio transmission system to permit notifications to be sent to field crews over radios. Um, so our geoscience team is, is um, on top of it. You know, they're also, um, we're looking at our seismograph system and um, looking at other opportunities. You know, we're undergrounding 10,000 miles. Um, so we're also looking at if there's opportunities for us to install dark fiber in trenches as well. It's, it's something we have just touched on very early phase, so we can't commit to anything, obviously. Um, but, you know, those are the things that we're considering. You know, how do we best leverage the infrastructure that we have and the opportunities as we do other work to also support earthquake early warning? Thank you. Can I just ask a clarifying question for uh, board staff or Phil, Philip, if you wouldn't mind, is just, um, I was thinking about the presentation we received earlier from Google, which was very, very good and very helpful. But once we have an 18 second, for example, warning, um, can you just remind us what exactly does pop up on the phone? Does it give you instructions on what to do or is it just truly the alert that is coming? So I think, um, so, you know, I can cover that in two ways. Obviously, though, th that alert and warning that comes through the cell phones are really kind of individual alert and warning, right? Earthquake is coming, take protective actions, you know, that's, I'm sorry, drop cover, hold on, which would be the, the actual, the exact message. Um, and, and, and so that's actually what's being seen by individuals um, via their, their phones. But that is... Um, the you know that that the, that delivery that alert delivery comes from the original shake alert signal mm -hmm. that Google taps. So once that signal is received, they take their automated actions 
you know, and send out the alerts to have this protocol. And Kevin is, I got some, I got, I got a lot of yeses up there. So, um, and that's, that's actually what happens. Okay. Does that answer good. your question? Yeah. I was thinking about the question that was posed to number three is that, is there anything that we can do as far as the warning? And I was just thinking about, you know, obviously with phones, with so many different notifications that we get. And then, you know, when you get an Amber alert, you know, it's different, but it's awareness right? It's awareness. You think about it. Okay, I'll think about it. And with this, this is awareness and action, right? So you get that very, you know, customized alert. And then I know, I'm just thinking like, if I got one, I'd be like, ah, <laughs> but if it's telling you what to do, very like earthquake is coming, get down. Because sometimes just the sound is, you know, it's a warning and yeah. just most of us are just not used to it. So as long as it's instructional, like you said, I think that's fantastic. And the specific, very specific message that gets sent out, it's earthquake, drop, cover, hold on, shaking is expected. And that is very consistent messaging that we have across the, the, the platforms because really we, 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 you know, you need the alert plus you need the instruction of what you should do on how to take protective actions. A lot of times we see that people receive the alert and the novelty of it all doesn't quite engage them in the way that we want them to, right? We want them to drop cover, hold on, shaking is expected, right? That's great. Thank you. Yeah, you have hit on yeah. the key for all of preparedness activities. Um, but this is one that I know with um, uh, um, in Bob DeGroote's um, presentation, he mentioned the social science and we've been participating in that. And um, they've done focus groups and asked people, you know, if, if you see this or you see this, what's going to make you, you know, take action. And, and it's extremely interesting. And in the past, with earthquakes that have occurred, for which we have sent out alerts, we actually have film in like a store as the shaking starts of people who obviously got an alert because they're looking at their phone and then they proceed to stand there and look at everything falling off the shelf. So yes, a lot of work still needs to be done in this area, which is why we have a whole section that's um, devoted to outreach and education. And we'll be touching on it right now too with the Great California Shakeout, but that's why you know drills are so important and, um, you know, when we're conducting education outreach, it's really interesting to see that often children are the ones that know best what it is to do. And it's more automatic for them to do it versus adults. And, you know, people that, you know, maybe grew up in different countries, their automatic is to, you know, run to the door frame or run outside to the parking lot. Um, so it, it's really interesting. And so there is a lot of social science behind it, but you know, there's just the basic importance of just practicing and conducting those drills. Okay, um, we will at this point move towards public comment. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. If you are in the room, the microphone at the podium next to the uh, public seating is available. Looks like we have one public comment from one of the partners. Hi, can you hear me, everyone? I'm uh, Alan Husker, professor at Caltech and also manager of the Southern California Seismic Network. Uh, we have a number of scientists that are uh, constantly working to try to improve the system. And the comments specifically that came from PG&E, we would love to be able to talk to them more directly. We oftentimes kind of lose that feedback. Um, and so I just want to extend uh, that offer. If there's any way to put us please in, 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 into contact, we'd really appreciate that to get some more feedback uh, for everything that we're doing. Uh, we understand that that's a, a real issue, trying to find that sweet spot, like she mentioned, for where you need to shut off a gas valve or don't shut it off. We know that that's very sensitive and we really would love to work with you more on that kind of detail if that's possible. Oh, absolutely possible. It takes Great. all of us, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so if if uh, we can exchange emails at some point through this whole thing, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'll put mine in the chat if you put yours in the chat. All right, great, thanks. Yeah, well, we You're could welcome. also connect 
we can also connect them, um, both Alan and, and Angie. So we'll we'll handle that on the back on the back end uh, through Dina. Okay, great. Okay, Thanks. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other public comments at this time? And I'll check to see the chat moderator. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question from Jessica. And she, her comment is, I heard a mention of data casting proving itself as a valuable technology for alerts. Does Cal OES have plans to pick up data casting again for phase two? So we are considering it. Um, that And what that is in reference to was we funded and completed um, phase one of a two phase project with our public television stations here in California. Um, so it's definitely something that we'll be looking at um, this year or the next for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with that, we will move into our education and outreach overview. And next to present will be Yvonne Durantes, Cal OES's EEW Education and Outreach Lead, who will provide an overview of the recent Great California Shakeout Tour. Yvonne, the floor is yours. So I think, you know, we landed perfectly with the conversation of education and outreach and the importance of it. I think you know, ultimately, education outreach is a huge component of EEW in terms of really building those bridges, making those, those connections. Um, and so, you know, through education and outreach is how we are able to let people know of our capabilities and even just the existence of the system. You know, through education and outreach, we're able to um, make sure others know of this uh, capability that you're able to integrate into your daily lives that can really potentially save lives. And so the seconds that EEW provides obviously can be life-saving and can really make a difference. And so for this reason, um, you know, we have this team that um, does all the education outreach for the state of California. And, you know, we have a lot of great partners and uh, great board members that are very active in participating through the process. So um, during the Great California Shakeout Tour, um, we kind of did a tour that was leading up to October 20th, which is known as the Great California Shakeout. And that's the drill that I mentioned in which everybody at the same time, and I think this year we had 9 million participants, drops, covers, and holds on, which is, you know, the, the best thing you can do. It's the, the, the most protective action you can do during an earthquake. And so we really are trying to promote that best practice and make sure that individuals are aware. And so the Great California Shakeout was like a prime opportunity for Cal OES to be able to raise awareness on earthquake preparedness and be able to educate California residents as well as critical infrastructure industries and industries all around as to what EEW is you know, what the, the MyShake app is and the, the ease with which you can download it to your phone and get those life-saving seconds. And so in partnership with our um, PIO shop, our public information office, EEW, um, you know, maximized this milestone by putting together this six-day tour leading up to the drill. And so we were able to stop at six different locations we had an information booth and we had media outlets there to educate the public and our and have our partners there as well. And so this tour allowed for us to also reach some of our underserved communities, um, some of our hard to reach populations. And, you know, like the director mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, you know, we'd really approached this with the whole community approach, which is really important to reach all Californians. And so the earthquake simulator provided, um, you know, the opportunity for people to be able to ride it and see what an earthquake feels like. It provides that shake intensity. And so the tour provided awareness opportunities for local media to be able to partner up with us and be able to, you know, share the information. And, and through the local media and all the major media outlets, we were able to reach ethnic communities. And, um, you know, we had all of the primary 
major Spanish speaking media outlets at almost every single stop too. So we were really able to reach that um, Latino population in California, which is a huge population. And so, you know, we had people of all ages writing the simulator. And so, you know, really we had this process um, which we conducted when we conducted our, our tour in April as well, the Earth, uh, California Earthquake Preparedness Month. So it was a similar process where we, we send people first to the simulator and we're like, uh, go ahead and go write it first and then come back and we'll talk to you about it. And so people come back really scared uh, after feeling the shaking intensity. And so, you know, it makes them really aware of the fact that you're not really able to, to run, um, might not even be able to walk during an earthquake. And so, you know, again, drilling down that importance of, you know, taking that protective action and that situational awareness to make sure that you know, to drop cover and hold on if that's the safest thing to do. And if not, make sure that you take protective action in the wet, best way possible. And so that was something that we really prioritized during this tour. And also, you know, this was a great opportunity to, to have people uh, remember that California is an extremely diverse state. You know, we, ha we have had COVID these past couple years. We've had wildfire storms, you know, drought. And so for all of that, um, not so much for COVID, but usually we have we have hours, we have days, weeks, sometimes even months of notification for some of this stuff. But for earthquakes, it is just a matter of seconds. And so I think that's something that the earthquake simulator really helps. It just really helps to drive that that point home that it, it is just seconds that we have to do something to take action. And so that's why it's so important to, you know, to drop cover and hold on or to have you know, our partners help people understand that if we are able to implement this into our various different industries, if we're able to implement this into our, our daily lives, like it could just really save life and critical infrastructure. And so some of our, our key measures of success include you know, over 500 simulator experiences through the tour. We had over $879,000 of ad equivalency. We had over 50 media outlets, 130 total measures, um, total mentions, which carried out for weeks. And this actually led up right in time, right before the Santa Rosa earthquake. I mean, the, the San Jose earthquake that happened on October 25th. And so, you know, it, it was a huge success in that aspect. And the earthquake um, stops that we had throughout the tour, throughout the six days, were in, in high traffic areas. So again, that whole community approach and just really trying to reach as many people and partners as possible. And so lastly, um, you know, even though our focal point of this tour was obviously to educate um, individuals about earthquake warning California, the California Earthquake Early Warning System, and the MyShake app, this really did serve as an opportunity to engage people on, you know, what we're trying to achieve with our future implementation plan, which is again, you know, bringing in those industries and making sure that we integrate it into our daily lives. Um, throughout the, our tour, we were actually able to talk to individuals from um, several of these industries and encourage our critical infrastructure industries to visit our website for information. You know, we have toolkits available online that are, um, sector specific. So, um, you know, for example, one of our stops was in San Luis Obispo. It was at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So we actually have a higher education specific toolkit available online for them to be able to integrate. Uh, and similarly with our first responder toolkit that we have available, one of our stops was also at the Bakersfield Fire Station. And so, you know, we obviously really are trying to encourage industries to adopt the EEW practices and technologies and really integrate those automated actions. And so um, we uh, have a couple pictures here as well from some of the, um, the, the drills. I think Lori's up there on the Great California Shakeout Day. And so just a reminder to please, um, you know, make sure to practice that with your family, friends, colleagues, everywhere you can. Um, so uh, lastly too, I just wanna make sure that um, we remember of the importance of, you know, collaborating and building these partnerships because um, we can't do one thing without the other. You know, we can't continue and in innovating this technology without 
sharing this technology and educating others, educating Californians. So, you know, we have these two pathways. We have the people and then we have the industries. And so we want to make sure that those continue to move forward. And so would also just want to uh, specifically thank um, board member Lupita for stopping by at our homeboys industry stop in Los Angeles. So thank you for participating in. Um, as Lori mentioned, you know, we do ha hope to have several more of these outreach events and tours uh, in the future. And we really hope that you, we can count on your partnership and that you are engaged throughout this process because like I said, you can't do one thing without the other. So we'll need as much help as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, right now we can look to see if we have any comments from the board. And if you're online, you may unmute. Derek, I'd like to go. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne, for that. It was a, I went to the Los Angeles session the day before the 20th, the great shakeout. And uh, my kudos to the team. You all did an incredible job with the simulator, the different kind of information. It drew a lot of media, um, which is always such a great part of like, they're an extension of our awareness because they're the ones that get the message out. And um, you were spot on earlier, Yvonne, when you mentioned about students, they know what to do because it's part of um, their curriculum on October 20th, every morning, you know, every year they, um, they go through the drill. And so they know and they bring it back home as well. And I thought that that session, you know, really when you get in the simulator, because we haven't had a big earthquake in LA, you forget what it's like and you forget to kind of plan and you forget to, um, you know, I can tell you right now that I'm not prepared at home today because it's been such a long time since we had one. And so it's just a good opportunity for us to continue to reinforce that. Thank you all. So, so I have to say, you know, we, it's, e it's very easy for us and program to get lost in the metrics and the technology and the complexities of this very large system with so many partners, right? When we talk about the media and the metrics, you know, we got this many interviews, we have so many impressions. It is because our strategy is based on that force multiplying uh, strategy of utilizing the media to amplify our message. And that's why these tours are so critically important to our overall plan for outreach and education, because we, it is much easier for us to be down there talking to 100,000 people all at once in one 20 second, you know, 30 second, even we've had even a segment go as long as nine minutes of them covering this topic. And so when we talk about the earned media strategy and the media, it is only the vehicle to get us to talk to the people because we could never buy a media package that will allow us to have an engaged audience as if we, you know, as, as, as when, you know, a, an outlet does a story on us that lasts three minutes, five minutes, nine minutes long. So, so really, you know, I, you know, it's something that I want to amplify something that Yvonne said is that we really feel that these tours set the groundwork for not only Santa Rosa and San Jose, and it almost create a watershed moment for us to really, not just in the brand recognition of the media outlets to see, to say, oh, wow, earthquakes. Hey, we should go talk to Cal OES because they have a message of downloading my shake and drop cover and hold on. And, you know, it's a trusted, it's a trusted agency. And, and so we're, you know, we're very pleased with the strategy. And more importantly, we're pleased with the fact that we've been able to get the message out to so many people in this way. And if I may, um, kind of going back to that part of the conversation where we were talking about the automated impl implementation in various sectors, it works the same way. So if PG&E puts you know, earthquake early warning into their buildings and then it gets picked up, which happened, and, and a story is written about it, then other utilities say, hey, we should be doing this too. You know, uh, Google gets really great press from their integrated alert system. So there may be another company out there that's seeing all this great press thinking, we got to do that too. One can only hope. 
So I'm, I'm uh, you know, just saying that amplification is, um, it, it works on both sides of this education. Well, one last thing, something that we saw during the, this tour in particular is that we were actually able to connect with multiple large companies that had people that came out to the event, such as Dignity Health and down in Southern California. And we had NBC Universal, I believe, that we also were able to create a contact with. So we do have that that dual, you know, that parallel effort of, you know, the individual, but also the industry slash sectors. We do have a hand raised from board member Amina Asefa. Amina, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I just kind of wanted to, um, I guess, kind of chime in around the industry actions and, you know, the the kind of two prongs of like personal preparedness and it's really important for people to drop cover and hold. We know that people are still not going to do it. We also know that um, and that people who are going to drop cover and hold and still be critically injured in the earthquake, right? Like we're there's going to be things that happen that are just out of our control. And I think that there is just a level of, as anyone who works in emergency preparedness knows, is moving the needle on personal preparedness is hard. Um, and it takes a lot of effort and that needle does not move very much. Um, and so, Laurie, I appreciate going back to like the industry specific actions and what, what does that look like? And, you know, I didn't say anything in the initial conversation we were having because I was just like trying to think of how to articulate this. What does adoption actually look like when you're talking about, well, how does the industry implement it? What does adoption look like? And when you were saying, well, we can have it in the EOC, it's like, well, what are you gonna have in the EOC? Is it on the PA system? Is it, what What are you actually gonna do? And, and I think that's where the struggle is. You, you know, for me, as I think about it, it's like, well, what does, what does this actually look like? Um, how is it integrated? And I went to the toolkit for higher education as you know, talking about you know having it on the PA system. Um, and I think yeah, th that's a good example. Um, and I say this with all love, you know, if it's not in the state EOC, how how are you expecting other? I mean, I think that's leading by example. You know, it should be something that is in these um, high profile bu buildings like the state EOC, the state EOC gets put on television all the time. Um, and to have that, you know, hardwired in there seems like a good first step and could, you know, show to other people how to do it. I, I guess I'm just, I'm still not sure, you know, I'm, I want to be the best board member I can be and take this back to the UC. We have thousands and thousands of buildings. Um, I just, I actually don't know how, and I think that's what I'm still struggling with. Um, and additionally, like I, I appreciate the toolkit. I think what would be helpful um, for certain industries is, you know, some kind of, and I know this may not be in the budget, but some kind of visuals like CGI or something where you show people, you know, getting notified or, and actually what, you know, kind of having a visual of what could be done versus just saying, just saying it in words. I think that would have more of an impact. Um, and I know for our healthcare industry, you know, we have five hospitals, like, I think that having that, you know, they actually do have fun funding and they can do things, having something that I could show them besides just telling them you can integrate it into your hospital build. I think that would be helpful. I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think you honestly expressed probably what every board member has felt at, at some moment or another. And I want to um, respond to some of the things that you raised. One is um, integrating earthquake early warning in the state operations center. And we actually are um, pursuing that. Um, but the state operations center is not in a hugely seismic, uh, seismically active area. Um, but we have other administrative offices in the state of California that have their own EOCs. And we're actually embarking uh, or will be soon on um, a new one in the southern uh, part of our state. So um, we've already 
started working with our logistics team who's managing that, um, that project to integrate earthquake early warning into those, um, those EOCs. And um, it will probably take the form of a PA and um, flashing lights or signage or all of the above. Um, because, you know, you have folks with different um, access needs. Um, so that's one thing. And then you also mentioned visuals and I'm right there with you. So we've actually created some video clips of um, where, what are we calling them? Um, success stories. Success stories of folks uh, or um, places that have integrated it. And we, um, we have those, they're on YouTube. We can provide you with like a library list um, and uh, USGS or others uh, partners may have more. Um, give us a quick rundown on the different industries that we've already done success stories on. Okay. We have done transportation with trains with Metrolink. We have done actually education with LAUSD in their implementation um, at, one, at um, uh, one of their sites. We have done Menlo, Park uh, Fire District with their um, with their configuration that they have with audible alarms, visual alarms, um, automatic gas shut off, and bay door stuff. Of course, I'm sorry, uh, bay doors. Um, as well as we're actually going to be looking into other um, 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 assets that have this integrated technology in Northridge Hospital being one of them, and the Regatta Seaside condominiums to speak to the housing element of integrated technology. I, I will add, Amina, that we also do have, um, um, uh, excuse me, toolkits that are specifically targeted at industries such as education. And we will, after this meeting, um, make them not only available to you, but we can also make ourselves available to kind of provide you a little more in depth as specific to your, to your sector of what, what it could look like um, potentially, especially for a um, for, for an organization that has as many buildings throughout, you know, high uh, high risk seismic areas. Yeah, and I would say we've got CSU and UC on this board, and you know, if you want, if you would start say in labs that handle. Um, uh, chemicals or something like that, you know, if that's where you want to start, or you see in some of your health facilities, um, we'll, we'll send out a, a team to film you, and then you get to become one of our success stories. Yeah, I think, you know, I appreciate that, and I appreciate kind of responding to my comments, and I, and I have looked at the toolkits, um, and just to kind of add on, you know, what I'm thinking in, as you were talking and is like, you know, we have a stadium um, at Berkeley that's, you know, built on a fault line and, um, you know, we don't have a success story there. Thankfully, we haven't had an earthquake on that, on the Hayward Fault, but if even creating like for stadiums, like I, I, what I was trying to say earlier is like, there's the personal preparedness, which is one prong, and then there's mitigating these impacts to critical infrastructure, which is gonna, so, you know, being able to do that is going to directly relate to our ability to recover from an earthquake. So if we protect our critical infrastructure, we speed up our recovery. And I assume that is the ultimate goal. Like we want people to be safe, we want life safety, um, but when we're talking about, you know, what happens after the earthquake is protecting our critical infrastructure and mitigating those risks. So if you think about 60,000 people in a stadium, um, you know, is there some kind of, you know, I'm thinking of a visual, not just for our stadiums, but all the stadiums of getting a message out onto the, you know, the PA system in a stadium, there's going to be an earthquake and, and seeing people taking pre protective action um, to protect themselves. So it's not something that's been done. It's not a success story, but it's a, this is, this is how this, this technology could be used. So it's like, you know, visuals for how it could be implemented that people maybe aren't actually doing yet. Um, and I'll stop there. So. No, I totally understand that. I mean, you know what, we, we, we're definitely going to look into that and we're probably going to make contact with you just to make sure that we kind of um, realize that that vision that you have and, and, and see how we can kind of um, get that implemented in some fashion. Um, thanks so much. Um, I do believe Jack does have a question online. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a comment is I wanted to to second the the idea of um, of you know trying to figure out how this plugs into our system. I I will say that you know I think we have a, a lot in common with our friends at the UC system and and uh, especially with the number of buildings we we look at things maybe a little differently than what you just described, not so much on function or like say a lab building or that. We actually have mapped all of our campuses and we've, uh, we've actually our ground motion coefficients that are uh, in chapter 16, we actually have come up with our own and actually um, we, have a, we have a triage of, of let's say campuses that are really high, uh, have high seismic activity versus, you know, campuses that don't. And so we, we, we look at it from that standpoint. I was glad that you were able to reach out at San Luis Obispo. I would encourage the, um, the staff to always go to the campuses. I, I can always put you in touch with uh, people that potentially could um, be part of that uh, outreach at the campus. Um, so just contact me for that. I have plenty of contact lists. And um, for our campuses, we, um, again, we, we have a, you know, any, at any moment in time, we have, you know, over 500,000 students um, wandering around on our, on our, on our property. And so from that standpoint, we're always uh, cognizant of that. Um, we also just to kind of let you know is we've gone through, we went through our own kind of um, um, a drill where we had an earthquake in Southern California. We, we simulated that. Um, I think it was back in June is when we did that. And we actually did it so that two campuses were affected, which was quite interesting. So we we would you know we and we had a we have a makeshift EOC that we stood up that we can stand up and we have a, a we have a, a system that we can communicate through so it would be nice to figure out how to get like I said earlier we were I one of the things that we all do and there's several of us at the chancellor's office do whenever there's a quake um, we look on our my shake and we look and then it gives us the indication of how to respond to the campus. So I just wanted to say, I really enjoyed some of the presentations today. And um, and I, I'm, I'm gonna be thinking a little bit more hard about how this plugs in to uh, certainly the CSU. Thank you, Jack, uh, board member Jack Anderson. That, and we can't stress enough that <clears throat> sort of the goal of this discussion today was the tip of the iceberg. We have done a lot of thought, in, um, as you might expect. We've put a lot of thought into it. We've developed some toolkits. We have things that are on the horizon, but we really wanted to get your wheels turning. So the fact that it, the picture isn't necessarily clear today is OK. This is a partnership. And larger than just our staff, we have the great partners behind uh, that fill in the seats behind you that we plan to work together. And this is the direction for us for years to come. So this is not something we expect to be solved tomorrow. And really do appreciate everyone's heartfelt thought into this. Okay, and with the uh, for sake of time, uh, we, we do, I think, need to at least open for public comment. Um, again, we'll allow for three minutes. Uh, if you have any questions and you're online, please put it in the Q&A section uh, or utilize the hand raise portion. And if you are here in the audience, you can approach the podium. All right, hearing none, I will turn it over to Deputy Director Najura for closing comments. I'd like to thank everyone today, not just for taking three hours out of your schedule to be here, but the robust conversation, um, the information that was exchanged. And I would like to um, identify a couple folks that have not been called out yet in the back of the room. We had, oh, we had the new executive director of the Seismic Safety Commission, Andy Ewardson, who, um, and uh, one of her staff, 
um, who have are now seated at Cal OES, and we're just thrilled um, to have that partnership with the Seismic Safety Commission. We also have our California Geological Survey here today, and um, they're a great partner as well. They've been building out stations and, and doing various things to further um, earthquake early warning as well. So we wanted to call that out. Thank you. And then I want to thank um, Google and USGS for um, presenting to us today and um, kind of blowing our minds with some of the things that you're doing. That's great. And keep at it. That's fantastic. Maybe we'll have you back in a couple of months and you'll have some new technology that you'll be revealing. Um, I also want to thank our partners that came um, here in the room. We've got Caltech and UC Berkeley. Thank you so much. And for any others that were online. And of course, for each and every board member um, today, thank you so much for coming and for um, your comments. And expect a phone call or an email if you um, brought up some ideas that um, we can we can use as a springboard to start up some of these new implementing projects. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Deputy Director Nizura. With that, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Would anyone like to motion? That we adjourn. And a second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion. Motion passes. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you all.